<laughs> cool. So, um, and uh, again, I went through a lot of stuff. So, um, um, you should have a feel, I hope, for how this stuff works. And um, and then, as you play with it with repetition, as long as you remain interested, you'll continue to play. If you're not interested, you can do other things. <laughs> Be, do what you're interested in. But if you're interested in this and you can do cool things and you think it's cool and you want to do more through repetition, you'll learn. You can do more and more complicated things to do even more cool stuff. But um, again, with what I showed you, you can do a lot of stuff. So, um, but that was just microcontrollers. Uh, next, I want to show you how to do Arduino. <laughs> but yeah, uh, any questions yeah, for Mitch, now so, before I go on? Mitch, yeah. So it turns out that this super absolute minimus, minimalist Arduino is just a chip and some component power supply and something next to it. Don't not even the crystal. Uh, you actually do need the crystal. Um, uh, For some, you don't need the crystal, but it's it's easier if you do have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but it is semi-optional. I have some other parts there that are definitely optional, like the reset button and um, uh, the power LED is also optional. You also don't need to have uh, an LED connected to pin 13 and all uh, Arduinos come with a visible LED connected to pin 13, which is why I chose pin 13 in my example earlier. Um, but you don't need that. It's just nice to have because then you know it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, a power LED. So here's my minimalist, um, oops, here's my minimalist um, Arduino. And um, you can see the green LED here is just power. This one I programmed to blink. And then um, here's a reset button. If I press that, it stops. And then letting go of it, it does its reset sequence, and then it just starts doing the Blink LED program. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of parts here which make the electronics a little more stable. These are capacitors. These help the power supply um, batteries last a little longer, makes the voltage smoother. These are not required, but they're kind of nice. The reset button isn't required, but it's kind of nice. Um, the power LED isn't required, but it makes it nice. This is kind of nice, because then you can just put a blink program in and see if it works. Um, yeah, and the ceramic resonator right here isn't required, but it makes it a little more complicated in your uh, development environment to use. If you have it, then you can use any Arduino, take this chip out of the solderless breadboard, plug it into an Arduino board over here that's connected to my computer, program it, with the Arduino, free Arduino software on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, then plug it back into here and it will just work. If you have um, no ceramic resonator, then you gotta do a little bit of mucking around on the Arduino development side before plugging it back into here. But it is possible. <laughs> so minimally, it's very minimal. It's mostly just the chip <laughs> yeah, yeah. with very little oak. Can can you describe? But those it? other parts are so cheap. Yeah. And they're they are each one does make it nicer, so it's kind of nice to have. But as you point out, they are optional. Yeah, I mean, like for example, the use case of our brick press, where our trigger times are like on the order of seconds. So maybe can you just describe really quickly what are those extra steps you need to do to program it to use it without the resonator? Um, let me. Put that off till later, okay? Because I'll show you now um, some cool stuff with actually using an Arduino. Okay. Um, if that's okay. Cool. So um, this is the part in the uh, uh, workshop normally where I show people how to solder. Soldering actually is easy, um, but I'm not going to go over that now. Normally we make this board, which is a kit, um, but I'm not going to do that. We'll I'll just show you with uh, an Arduino, and um, um, once you make the board, you connect a power supply, and then it does this cool little blinky pattern, um, which uh, is kind of fun. But um, um, but let me show you 
Uh, that Arduino, just like all the others, works with the same free Arduino software. And that's true with Arduino Uno and all the clones, plus all the other Arduino boards that are made, and there are a lot of them now. Um, this is that uh, external cable with the USB controller chip. Um, there are a lot of these, like that red board is available from China for, if you buy one, it's available from China for like three three dollars, um, uh, but it has the wrong pinout for Arduino projects. So, me and my friend Tully make that green board and attach it to it, and then we sell. Uh, I sell these uh, these boards again. I don't make any money from it, um, <laughs> but just to make it available for like six dollars. And um, but other people will sell them as well, and whatever hackerspaces all have these, you can use them for free. If you have this, or even if the Arduino, the Arduino has the USB controller chip built in, you have to make sure there's a driver on your lap or tablet to con uh, so it understands that USB controller chip. And all of them come with drivers for Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. And you install the driver, and then your computer sees a serial port. And a serial port is what all computers used to have, have inputs and outputs to all sorts of um, external uh, things like webcams and whatever. Now we have USB, which is called universal serial bus uh, form of serial. But these USB serial converter chips make it look like the old kind of serial port, which is still really useful. Um, and those drivers are, you can download for free. And, uh, and many of those are open source, many of them aren't. So, um, so anyways, here is the uh, shortened URL to get to my um, uh, Arduino for Total Newbies. It's, that's what I call this workshop, Total Newbies in uh, hacker language. Uh, total Newbies are people who don't know anything yet, but are curious and want to learn. So this is Arduino for Total Newbies, the number four. A4TN. So you can go to that. And, and it matters that the A, T, and N are big letters. They have to be uppercase. <laughs> this this big cat wants in on the workshop. So, um, um, but I'll, I'll just show you how to get there also. Here's my website. And then if you go to the projects tab, And then once you're at the projects tab, you just scroll down. This is <laughs> my website needs some work, but it's a long, long, long website with all my open source projects, all of my projects. And you, then you see this picture of the first time I gave this workshop, which is 50 people at Noisebridge Hackerspace uh, in San Francisco learning how to solder and making um, those Arduino kit boards. And then that last link, Arduino for Total Newbies workshop page, click on that. And then, um, uh, then you get the same picture, but then you can scroll down to stuff you can download. The first link is the Arduino download page, where you can download Arduino software for free for Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. And then the next thing is um, the driver for uh, the um, the one that, um, that I have, which is this thing. Um, and also for the, uh, another popular one, which is the first company to make the USB serial chip. And they're kind of a slimy company, and they charge a lot, but they're called FTDI. So uh, it shows the drivers there. And then you can download the TVB Gone Sketch, which is the controlling firmware, controlling program for TVB Gone. If you connect five parts to an Arduino, and then program your Arduino board for TVBGON with this sketch. You now have a TVBGON. You can go anywhere in the world with your Arduino board and battery pack and those five parts and turn TVs off everywhere. Um, yeah, and then the next thing is the schematic diagram that I showed at the beginning that maybe looked kind of scary, but I'll show you how that's actually really cool. And then the blue arrows show here the, the slides. 
That's actually, and that includes all of the steps for soldering the board together. You can ignore those. Okay. So um, the Arduino page, um, the driver page, uh, these are external websites, and then uh, the TV on sketch is just a download, and the TV on schematic is a PDF you can download for free. And um, yeah, so if you have one of these, you have to hook it up correctly, and they're labeled. I'm, I won't go over that since we're not using that today. But here, when you download the um, uh, Arduino software, you just double click on it, and it installs, and it just works. And then you have to do two things to set it up the first time you use it. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that now. <clears throat> Both of them are in the Tools menu. <clears throat> so the, the, the Tools menu, um, if you go to Tools, the first thing you do is show it which board. <clears throat> We're using, uh, for people who bought, uh, bought the parts, uh, and again, like we, we didn't charge uh, any extra for the parts. This is we just charged what they cost. So if you got them, um, that's just what it costs. And uh, you have to tell it that it's an Arduino Uno, and uh, that's the all of those choices there. Um, but only the Arduino Uno uh, is the one we want for today because it's an Arduino Uno clone. Okay, and then the software knows which board you have. Then you tell it which serial port. Okay, usually, there'll, if you have uh, Windows or Linux, there will just be one choice there usually. I have other stuff connected to my computer, so there's more choices. Uh, Windows serial ports have COM, COM, and then a number. Uh, Linux will say USB TTY0. If you have Mac OS, though, there will be lots of choices, but only one of them, uh, depending on your uh, which version of Mac OS you have, only one of them will say um, uh, USB uh, or TTY. Um, the others will say like Bluetooth and other choices. In order for this to, um, the correct choice to appear, whichever your operating system, you have to have the driver already installed and the Arduino has to be connected to your USB. Okay, so first you um, download and install the Arduino software, then you plug, you install the driver for your USB chip and uh, if you have a regular Arduino from the Arduino company, it, you can, uh, along with the Arduino software, you have the option of, uh, when you install the Arduino software, it asks you, do you want to install the driver? Uh, if you have a regular Arduino board, you say yes. If you don't, you have to install the driver separately. But Linux almost always has the um, driver built in for most uh, um, distros of Linux. It's already built in for almost all of the USB controller chips. So you don't have to do that. But for Windows and Mac OS, you do. Okay, and those are external links. And then you do these two steps that I just showed you in the tools menu, the board and the port, and then it's set. You don't have to do that ever again. It's set up. And uh, unless you change the board, or the USB controller chip. Okay, now we're ready to um, uh, play with Arduino software. The Arduino software comes with lots and lots and lots of examples. So again, you don't already need to know how to um, program in order to uh, do lots of cool things with Arduino. Um, you do need to know how to hack on Arduino sketches, though. And I'll show you how to do that now. But without a cat. Okay, so um, 
let's do the Hello World program first, which is one of the examples. And the examples have lots of documentation built into them, which make it easier to do. So to get the examples, you go to the Files menu, and then Examples, and then <clears throat> at the top there are these categories, categories 1 through 11, and then each of those categories have example sketches. And again, sketch just means a program in, in Arduino language. Um, so the one we want now is examples, basics, blink. Blink is hello world. That's, that's this. And um, OK, and then when you do that, then you get uh, this. And I'm going to stop uh, sharing my um, presentation. And I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, I'm going to share my whole screen this time. Um, so we can see the Arduino software. Wait for that to catch up. <laughs> I just have a question. Um, when yeah. I go to my port, uh, like I didn't download any drivers ahead of time, but it says for me, I have Windows, it says COM5, and in parentheses, Arduino Uno. Did it already recognize yeah. it? So I should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. if that's there, it has recognized successfully that your uh, driver is installed correctly and it sees the port. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, so that's that's a good sign. Okay, so here is the complete um, Hello World program called Blink. Can is is that readable? Mm -hmm. Good. So if you use the um, Arduino software, there's different colored text on the screen. So um, there's gray, dark gray, black orange and blue the this is text on a screen and this is the this is the code there's all these lines of code but um, this needs to be converted into a form the microcontroller understands and then sent to the microcontroller if you have your Arduino board connected to your USB port it's red, and you've done those first two setup steps, and the drivers and that to happen, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. But only the black, blue, and orange co uh, uh, text is real code. The gray and dark gray text is called comments. And comments are only there for you, the human, reading this program, this sketch, as they call it in Arduino, uh, to know what this does. Now, in um, some people say that comments in a program are optional. And if the people who say that are terrible software engineers. So comments are not optional because humans need to be able to read this. If you don't have comments, even if you wrote the program a week later, even a simple program, you won't remember what you were thinking. Because you have a life, and you've gone through all these different cool things in your life, or terrible things, or both, um, and anything in between. Uh, and then you come back to this, and you won't remember what you were thinking. So comments are really, really important. The gray text are comments. And the gray text, I'll scroll up to the top. Light gray text starts with this. I'll highlight it. Slash star. That everything after the slash star is now light gray text, and that is just comments. And then that ends with star slash. And then here's another form of comment. It starts with slash slash. Everything to the right of slash slash is comment. And that can be at the beginning of a line, or it can be here, it's indented a little. Here, down here, it starts slash slash after some colored text. The comments can start anywhere, but everything to the right of that is now comment. 
let's go scroll back up to the top now. Here's comment. The top line tells you the name of the program, the, uh, the, the, the sketch. Okay, and then it says here, that's blink. And then it says what it does. It turns an LED on for a second, off for a second, and then repeat over and over again. And then it gives um, some other info and then credits. And then it gives you uh, a link where you can actually see more info. But then we have the actual code. All Arduino sketches, programs, have two sections. Here's the first section called setup. <clears throat> Here's the second section called loop. These sections must be there. They can have no lines in them, or they can have one or two or 50,000 lines. It doesn't matter, but the sections have to be there. They can be empty or super full, okay? Um, <clears throat> that is the only difference between this and C++. This is the C++ programming language. Um, but they don't call it that because it's for non-geeky artists, so they call it wiring. But it's C++. It's a C++ programming language. Plus, they, uh, in addition, they, they gave you lots of examples, and they gave you some um, nice lines that do lots and lots of cool tasks for you. Those are called functions in C++, um, and they don't give them a name in Arduino language. But um, um, they do all the nitty-gritty things for you, so you don't have to think about it. So here is uh, the one line in the setup section. Most software geeks would call setup, the setup section, they would call it init or initialize. And this is all the stuff that's done once at the beginning of your program. And here are some comments that tell you what the setup does. It runs once when you turn on the power. So when I turn the switch on for the power supply, it does what's in setup once and then never again. It'll also do it if you push the reset button, because a reset button is the exact same thing as turning a computer off and on again. Then it goes down to loop, and it does what's in loop again and again and again and again and again for as long as the power is on. And in this case, there are four lines, these four lines. And it just does those again and again and again until you turn the power off. And it says that here in this comment. It runs over and over again forever, or until the batteries go dead. Okay. So the um, if it, if there's a comment above a section, that usually tells you what the section does. If there's a comment to the uh, above a line or to the right of a line, that that usually tells you what the line does. So in this case, it tells you what this line does here. The this is dark gray text. It's a comment. It tells you what this colored text underneath it does. Um, that is, you know, it looks weird, pin mode, parentheses, all this stuff, semicolon. Don't worry about that. Read the comment. Initialize the pin as an output pin. All Arduinos um, that are made by Arduino have a built-in LED, which is on pin 13. And it, they give it a name. And the name is called LED underscore built-in. It's the built-in LED pin. So look at this line, <laughs> orange and blue and black. It says pin mode. That, will, that allows um, what the comment says. It can make a pin an output pin. It can also make an input pin, though. Um, so here it says LED built-in. That catch up, and here it says output. So this makes the built-in LED pin an output pin, which is what we need to be able to turn it on and off later. Let's say though, I'm not, you know, like this is 
the, the program that we want. But let's say if you want to hack on this, we want to um, make that pin an input pin instead of an output pin. What would I do? What, how do I change this line? We actually don't want to do this. But if I did, how do I change this line to make the built-in LED pin an input pin? This is not a trick question. <laughs> All I do is change this to input. OK, but I'll control Z to, to change that back. But let's say I want two output pins instead of just one. Again, we don't want to do this, but just let's say we do. OK, I just copied that and then pasted it. So now I have two the same, but uh, now I, let's say I want pin three to be an output pin. Well, there it is. That's how easy it is to hack on these programs. You don't have to understand C++, and you don't have to understand pin mode parentheses and commas and semicolons and all this stuff. You just have to read the comment and then try stuff. If, you, if it doesn't work as expected, it can be a little frustrating, but there's no big deal. You won't break anything. Just try shit and see what happens. It's actually fun to play around with it this way. So again, you know, I don't want to do this, um, so I'll control Z to undo it. But this is the way you do that. So that is the first part of Hello World. We need an output pin. Built into the Arduino board is an LED on pin 13 with a resistor already built into the board, so no magic smoke goes away. We can turn, once it's an output pin, we can turn that LED on and off, and that's what happens down here in the loop section. And again, the comment up here tells you that. It runs over and over again, and what happens is shown in the comments to the right here. The first line, the comment shows you that it turns the LED on. The next line delays, it waits a while so that it's on long enough for us with human eyes to be able to see it. Wait for a second, it's a delay. And then the next line, you can see the comment says, turn the LED off. And then we have to wait a while so that we can see that it's off. And then the loop goes to the top. Oh, and by the way, the Arduino people call this a loop. Software geeks, software engineers call this a loop. They, they left that the same, <laughs> OK? So it goes, that just goes back to the top line again. And then it turns it on for a second. You know, it turns it on and then waits a second. So it's on for a second. Then it turns it off and then waits for a second. And then it goes back to the top again, where it'll repeat. Turn it on, wait a second, turn it off, wait a second, turn it on, wait a second, et cetera, et cetera. So, but this is just text on a screen, OK? So here, let's see, how do I do this? Um, <laughs> I need to rearrange my, um, um, my video. Um, okay, so here's my Arduino board connected through my USB cable to my um, um, uh, laptop. And you can see I programmed this purposefully different. You can see the way the LED is blinking. It goes blink, 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 blink. The program I have on the screen that's just text. It's connected to um, the, the Arduino board. It's connected to my laptop, which has the text on the screen over there. Um, but that text on the screen needs to be converted into a form the Arduino um, board microcontroller understands. And it needs to be sent through the uh, USB controller chip and all that to the memory here will it be uploaded and then executed. And then it will do what this program told it to do. OK, and to do that, all you have to do is click on this button here. That's called the Upload button. And when I did that, um, can you see to the right, uh, there's th three little square buttons. 
Uh, don't worry about the square buttons, but to the right of that, it says upload. Mm -hmm. And the button lights up. I take it away, the button stops lighting. When I put it back, it lights up again. If I click on that, then you'll see down below um, in, in the black uh, rectangle at the bottom, uh, it'll show you some stuff and there'll be a green progress bar in the lower right. So see the green progress bar? And then down in the blue uh, bar with the, the green progress bar at the right, look to the left, all the way to the left on that blue bar, it says compiling sketch. Compiling means converting the text into a form the microcontroller understands. And then once it finishes doing that, um, then it will send that uh, uh, to the microcontroller, and that's called uploading. And once it uploads, then um, it'll be ex it'll start executing. So look at the red LED. It's blinking twice now because it's compiling. Um, and uh, my computer is running really slow because Java is interacting with the uh, communication software that we're using with all our video. Um, but it'll be done soon. Um, and um, uh, give it a, a second here. Compiling. It's supposed to take like a quarter of a second, and instead it's taking like a minute. But um, it's still compiling. The progress bar is now done compiling. So it should start uploading momentarily, I hope. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of patience, sorry. It's taking so long. Uh, but in the, the, the text at the bottom, it says linking. That's, that means it's almost finished with all the stuff. And um, now it says uploading. There it is. Now it's done uploading. Now look at the red LED. And you can see it's blinking on for a second, off for a second, on for a second, off for a second, on for a second. Right? So that's all there is to it. Um, and it works with or without a cat. Um, so. Um, Let's, uh, that's, you know, that's really cool the first time you do that, but um, then after a few seconds it gets boring. So let's hack on this to do something more interesting. Um, we can make the LED blink quicker. So how do I do that? You decrease the... Yeah, so let's make it blink 10 times faster. So I'll, I'll make, instead of a... oh. By the way, these the delay, the delay here. It, these are called functions. The orange letters are functions, so they do cool stuff for you. And the comments tell you what they do. Um, you know, and you can see the comment for this line here says, "Wait a second. It's it's but the code itself is actually delay a thousand. It delays a thousand units of time. The units are milla. A milla is a thousandth of a second." So a thousandth of a second, one over, one over a thousand. So a thousand units here, um, a thousand units or a thousand milliseconds, which is one second. Okay, so I'm gonna change it from a thousand to a hundred. And same down here. But notice that's just text on a screen. The LED is still blinking the same. In order to change that, uh, to, to update that, then I've got to go back to the upload button here and then click on it. So I just clicked on it. And um, so it will compile. And wow, well, it's interacting with this uh, video conferencing software in weird ways. My computer's going very slowly. Um, so, um, uh, it should do that in a quarter second, <laughs> but let's give it time to do its thing. Um, so it's now compiling, and it's giving you the information at the bottom, and um, it's converting the text into a form the microcontroller understands. Once it finishes compiling, then it will send it to uh, that in a form the microcontroller understands. It'll send it to the microcontroller's memory where it will then run, and then the red LED will blink 
in its new way rather than in the old way. And um, when you're using this on your computer, maybe it'll do it more like in a quarter second rather than in a minute. Um, but um, it should upload shortly. There it goes. Now it's uploading and finished compiling. And now it's done uploading. And now look at the red LED 10 times a second instead of one time a second. And we don't also, we don't have to make them blink on and off at the same rate. Let's change the off time to be one second. So I'll add a zero back in there. So now here is a thousand instead of a hundred, but up here is a hundred. Okay, but that's just text on a screen. In order to make it happen, I've got to click the upload button. So I'll do that. And then once it finishes, the red LED will go lip, lip once per second. Okay, and then once it does that, then I'm going to show you that um, that amber LED that I made light up with uh, coin cell. I want to make this LED light up, not the one on the board, but this one. And to do that, I can make use of these connectors with holes in them, which connect directly to the LED uh, to the microcontroller pins. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, unfortunately, the uh, the software is running really slow. Um, that makes it a bit annoying. But now it's uploading, and you'll be able to see it. So now, now it's doing the right thing. So it blips once per second, which is what I told it to do on the uh, hacked um, software. Now, this software is being hacked now in a good way. That just means modifying it to do what I want rather than what the original person intended it for. The original person intended this to blink the built-in LED once per second. But I changed it to be different rates. And now I'm going to use it to not blink the built-in LED. It'll also do that blinking, uh, the built-in one. But I want it to do this one, an external LED. So let me um, go back to... Um, Look at the screen again, and I'll go back to my presentation. Um, um, yeah, so here's um, an Arduino board. This is the yellow one rather than the blue one, but it's exactly the same. You can look at the, um, the top row of connectors in the bottom row. The bottom row has some controlling kind of things. <clears throat> it also has some analog inputs, which I won't really talk about, but you can put analog voltages in here, and it can control the um, microcontroller if you have uh, a sketch that is appropriate for it. Um, but you can also put an external power supply in there, like a battery pack. But the top row connects to pins, which can be inputs and outputs. The built-in LED is pin 13. So look in the top, um, towards the left, you can see on the right it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then there's a teeny little gap, and then it goes 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 is a little bit in a shadow there, but the one right next to it is called ground, G-N-D, that stands for ground. There's two other ground pins down below. Um, G-N-D is kind of big there, and it covers two of the holes. So those are both ground, and the one to the left of pin 13 is ground. If I take this amber LED and put the long lead, the plus lead, the plus lead into pin 13 hole, and the ground lead into, uh, into the ground hole next to it, then it'll light up. So let's do that. Look at that. So now I'm making the external amber LED lighting up. 
The um, internal one is also lighting up, but it's kind of dimmer because this one's stealing a lot of the energy. And it's stealing more of the energy because I cheated again. I don't have a resistor in series to guarantee the magic smoke doesn't go away. But there are built-in resistors in this chip that do that for you. And, and normally you don't want to do that. So on a solderless breadboard, though, we have more holes so we can add an LED and a resistor. And I'll show you that uh, next. But um, for now, you can see it can light up an external part. It can power an external part. Now I'm going to take this part, this amber LED, out. And I happen to have another part here. This is a motor. The motor, I just put some tape on it so you can watch it spin. And here's a red and a black wire. This just came from a toy. This is a three volt toy motor. So if I put this in pin 13 and ground, what do you suppose will happen? Well, the pin 13 will turn the motor on and off instead of an LED on and off. So let me do that. And you can see it doing that. If I hook it in the other the way around, black to pin 13 and red to um, ground, it'll spin the opposite direction. That's what DC mm. motors do. So, um, this is another, <clears throat> this is a, a, a hardware hack of our Hello World program. Now imagine hacking on the pulling program again, just a little bit. Instead of one output pin, I have two. And each one goes to a motor. Robot with wheels. And if I want to make the robot move forward, I turn both output pins on to make both motors spin at the same rate, going, and then the robot will go forward. If I turn only one motor on, the uh, robot will turn right. If I turn only the other motor on, the robot will turn left. If I turn them both off, the robot stops. And so a simple robot controller is actually a hack of Hello World. Hmm. And now, let's do a different hack. Here is a speaker. And I'm going to put this in pin 13 in ground. So pin th uh, speakers are, are a little bit tricky to think about. Um, so a speaker can be turned on and off, but that's not how we usually use speakers. We pulse speakers on and off at quick rates. If we just turn a speaker on and keep it on, it'll make a click when we turn it on. Mm -hmm. And then later, when we turn it off, it'll disengage, and then we'll hear a click when we turn it off. And that's what will happen here once per second. I don't even hear this, because my microphone won't really respond. But right now, this speaker, every time the controlling firmware thinks that it's turning the LED on, the speaker clicks. When it thinks it's turning the LED off, it clicks again. Since the LED is going, um, uh, where is it? Um, on off, on off, on off, on off. What you hear on the speaker, if you could hear it, uh, is click, 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 click. Click, 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 click. OK, so that's not very interesting um, because the click rate is not within the range of our human hearing. Our human hearing requires between 20 and 20,000 times per second. 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz, in other words, electronic speed. So let's go back to here and change the rays to be within that range. So if I make both of these 10, 
then it's on for 10 milliseconds, off for 10 milliseconds, on for 10 milliseconds, off for 10 milliseconds. That's 20 milliseconds total. Um, so that means it will turn on and off 50 times per second, which is within the range of human hearing. And you'll be able to hear that if I hold it up to the microscope, uh, the, the, the microphone. So let me um, go back to the upload button here and do that. And <clears throat> then once it goes through its very slow compiling and uh, then it'll do a quick upload and then you'll be able to hear that. And um, um, 50 hertz is the rate of the wall outlet in Europe, it, uh, pretty much the entire world except the US. Mm -hmm. And if you are a guitar player, then you hear and you're not in the US, then that's the noise you hear that in the background that most people don't want to hear. Um, in the US, you hear 60 hertz, which is even slightly more annoying because um, that's the rate of the wall in the US. Um, and that's the noise that is all over the planet now and pervading our bodies. And we seem to be able to handle it. Um, but uh, we didn't evolve for it, but somehow we can handle it. And somehow we can handle it also all of the um, gigahertz. <laughs> that's that's uh, a, a thousand billions um, uh, times per second with Wi-Fi and all of that. So now it's uploading. Now you can hear it if I hold it up to the microphone. You can hear that, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's an annoying noise, but um, I'm going to uh, uh, make it do an uh, uh, 10 times higher, um, which is 500 times a second. <clears throat> and this is making a square wave. So if you play around with um, music and music synthesizers, a square wave is a basic waveform, which isn't particularly pleasing, but can be interesting for music, uh, electronic music. There's also sine waves, which are really, really smooth, which aren't very interesting, but they're very smooth. And then if you combine sine wave and triangle wave and square, wa uh, and square wave and pulse waves and all these different things, then you can get super interesting sound. I mean, you make them louder and softer. Um, so this is kind of the basis of music synthesis. Um, and um, so you'll see that after it compiles, which is taking a long time, this will be um, um, 10 times higher. So that'll be um, um, an, uh, a much higher pitch. So imagine, uh, and, and you'll hear that, but um, imagine packing this Hello World program further. So instead of just the speaker on an output pin, well, here, here's the, uh, <laughs> Kitten doesn't like that sound. So um, there's that sound. Um, imagine hacking this this further. The uh, control Z and reprogram. Here we go. And now I'll start that process because I'll need that um, again later. Um, imagine hacking this Hello World program further so that in addition to the speaker on an output pin. I also have 12 switches, each on an input pin. Button I'm pushing when, and depending on which button. And then I've created a simple music synthesizer just by hacking Hello World. Pretty cool. And then with some more complicated code, I can make um, very interesting sounds, which is what I do with my music synthesizer project that I played a short video of earlier. That was uh, making a, a waveform called a sawtooth. Um, and to talk, I, I won't talk about that now because that, that gets um, pretty complicated. <clears throat> I've given talks about it, so if you're interested, just search for uh, my name and Ardu Touch. <laughs> uh, it's an Arduino-based synthesizer with a touch keyboard. You just touch the keyboard on the board, and it, it knows you're pressing it. So Ardu Touch. And you, you, you can learn uh, from that if you want to. So anyways, um, let's go uh, 
now uh, back to my presentation and um, we can learn about solderless breadboards. Um, and a solderless breadboard is really the same as those holes on the Arduino board, except there's no microcontroller built in. There's nothing built in. There's just holes. And um, um, let's see, maybe it'd be better. Yeah, I'm going to, um, uh, let's see, go back here. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, oh, damn, I um, um, started from the beginning accidentally. Um, let me scroll down again. Actually, too bad. Yeah, okay. Um, get back to the Saturday breadboard slide. There we go. Okay, so now I got it. Let me go back here. I'll stop sharing my screen, and then you can see better the. Um, and I'll share this full size slide again. Does that work? We've got the infinite. Doesn't seem to be stopping sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Button clicked. Okay, so I guess we don't have that option. Um, is this big enough to see? Can you see um, my my cursor here going across? Here's the number one, yeah. two, three, four, five, and it goes up to number thirty. Is that readable? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So these numbers here are just for you, the human, to be able to name the columns. And then here are letters so that you, the human, looking at this can be give a name to the rows. So here's row A, B, C, D, E. And then there's a gap. And then there's row F, G, H, I, J. There's also these two rows here. This one's labeled red plus and blue minus. So let's ignore these two rows at the top and these two rows at the bottom for now. Um, but here is, for instance, column seven. And then here's row C. So this is whole number seven C. If you've ever played the, the, the old game Battleship, it's kind of the same idea. If not, don't worry about it. This is column seven, row C. So this is whole. 7C. That's the name of this whole. These five, 7 A, B, C, D, E, are all underneath the board connected to each other. So if I plug a wire into 7C, and then I plug another wire into any of these other ones above or below it, A, B, C, D, or E, well, I can't do C because it's, I have a, a, wire, a wire in it. So I can plug a wire into A, B, D, or E, and then those two wires are connected. But these four, 7, F, G, H, I, J, they are not connected to 7, A, B, C, D, or E. But these five are connected to each other. So if I plug a wire into 7F, I can plug a, a wire or a part into 7 G H I or J and it will be connected to the wire in 7 F. Make sense? Cool, so um, let's plug an LED in there. Here's my amber LED. I want to make this light up on my solderless breadboard. So I'm going to plug it in. It doesn't matter where I plug it in as long as the long and the short leads are left and right from each other. Oh yeah, so holes to the left or right, if the board's oriented this way, only up and down are connected to each other. Left and right are not connected to each other. So as long as I connect this amber LED into the board, um, where the leads are left and right from each other, they're not connected 
together. And um, what do I have on here? I have the short. <laughs> Which one's long and short? So I just did that here, just like the picture on my um, uh, on my screen. And Kitty Cat's back again. <laughs> um, so I can plug a wire into here, which I will now do. Mitch, your screen is so not just showing to agree, you want to do your screen. Uh, Sorry? Your screen is not showing if you want to show the screen. It's not showing? No. Oh! It, oh! Yeah, I definitely want to show the screen. So, um, ah, I can do that again. Wow, there was a long delay. Um, let me just share the whole screen again. Allow. Okay. Wires, of course, are fantastic cat toys. Mm -hmm. As far as good for electronics. <laughs> Wait, so just to reiterate, um, going like all the tens are in series, and then um, if it's and then A and B aren't connected. Uh, okay, so to say again, um, the screen's being shared. So is that that working? Yeah, that's yeah. better. Okay, good. So I have the LED. It turns out on the picture here, I have the short lead in 7B. Yeah. And I want to connect this wire to the short lead of the LED. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, I can connect this wire, one side of the wire, to so, either seven, so. any of the ones above or below in the in that set of five, column seven, A, B, C, D, or E. Mm -hmm. Seven B is already taken with the short lead of the LED, so I can plug this wire into seven A, seven C, D, or E. Got it. Okay, if I plug it into 8B, it will not be connected to the LED short lead. Okay. The LED long lead is in 6B, which is now not connected to anything except the holes, which are empty. Okay, so right now I'm going to plug this into 7C. And now this wire, which happens to be green, is the the short <laughs> is the short LED wire, and it, likewise, I'm going to take this red wire and connect it to the long wire of the LED, which is in six B. I can plug this into six A, six C, six D, or six E. Mm -hmm. So I'll plug it into six C. What the hell? And I'll put the kitty cat back in the ground. <laughs> are you bending and the, are you this bending red the, wire? Sorry, Mitch, are you bending the sorry? LED wires? Are you bending the LED wires so they go in the holes or trimming them off? Or Oh, these, these uh, are jumper wires. No, but so the LED. The LED? Yeah, the LED wire, mean? since one is longer than the other, do you have to cut one off? Cut one lead off. Ah uh, no, these holes are deep enough. Oh, they're deep enough. You don't okay. Have to, you don't. Have to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, it they they have these these they're kind of it, underneath the board. It's kind of like this. And when you push the wire in there, these are springies, but they push together this way. Okay. And when you push the wire in there, it's connected, and they're the holes are deep enough so that the long and the short wire are both connected in there. So the green wire is now connected to the short wire, the minus short lead, and the red wire here is now the equivalent of the long plus lead of the LED. Okay, so just like before, I can take my Arduino board. Before I plug the LED directly into the board and into the ground, but I can do the equivalent of this now. I'll plug the red wire into pole 13 here, and the black wire into ground, and check it out. 
Okay, so I did not, though, put a resistor in series, but now I can. Unlike when it was directly into the board, it would have been difficult. I could have like held it with my fingers and stuff, but now I can actually add a resistor in series with either the red or, in this case, the green wire. So let me do that. So I have some pictures here. Um, so here's, here's what I have now. Um, I can pull out this black wire from so that it's not connected or in my actual circuit here, the green wire. I can pull it out and put it left somewhere. It doesn't matter where, as long as it's an empty column. And then I can take a resistor, which happens to be one kilo ohm, one k ohm, okay. and I can connect it to that green wire, and then take the other side and connect it to the short wire, and I can put the cat on the ground, <laughs> which always helps. And um, check it out, the LED is blinking, but dimmer than before. And if I want it to be even dimmer, you can tell with you know the technology we have now, but it's it's definitely dimmer than before. And if I pull the one K resistor out and put in a ten K resistor, then it will be even dimmer. Now it's very dim. Can you see it? Okay, so that's how we can play with um, our breadboards. And um, <clears throat> now let me show you. This is on the screen um, is resistor, the LED, the solder as breadboard, a red and a black wire, and it shows you know arrows going to the Arduino board and 13 in ground. Um, it's really a pain to um, create that. I use this free open source software called the GIMP, which is a really, really powerful, very much like Photoshop, but free and open source. And um, I take, and I'm good at it, but it takes me about 20 minutes to create this. Schematics are way, way, way better for communicating a circuit than a drawing. Uh, you have to be a pretty decent graphic artist or an artist to do this and make it understandable. But a schematic can do much. Here's the schematic for that circuit, for this project. So the uh, schematic has a bunch of symbols and lines. Lines are, the, are a wire. Every wire on the schematic, every line on the schematic is a wire. Every wire on my actual physical project is a line on the schematic. Every symbol on the schematic is an electronic part on my physical board. Every part on my physical board is a symbol on the schematic. It's just one to one. And if you know a few symbols, then it's super easy. So for instance, on the screen, is a black rectangle with a word Arduino in it. What do you suppose that is? <laughs> Not a trick question. <laughs> yeah. So it's really common in a schematic to only show the pins that are actually used. So I've got five volts on the ground, and I've got pin 13. Um, so inside, uh, can you see that inside there's some really light gray stuff going on? Yeah. That's a resistor and the LED, built-in LED, that's already built into the board. But outside, we see some other symbols and, and wires, lines, wires. Okay. So first of all, let me show you um, uh, the in the middle of the Arduino uh, symbol, in the middle 
uh, it says GMD at the bottom. That is a ground pin. That's the same as one of the ground holes. And it doesn't matter which of the three ground holes you use. That's one of them. And then there's a line, meaning a wire, going down to that sort of weird little triangular symbol with three lines. So that symbol that looks like a triangle with, made out of three lines, that's the schematic symbol for ground. And in an electronic circuit diagram, whenever you see that, that just means connect a wire to ground, the black wire of the power supply. And now look in the middle on the top, and it's 5, five, five uh, ECC. And then you see a line of wire going to a little circle marked with 4.5 volts. That's the symbol for power. And it's usually marked with the voltage. In this case, we're using um, a, power, a power pack. A power pack with 4.5 volts, 3 AA batteries. So, um, so we can do that. And um, uh, you, you, we can use that for a power supply. So wherever you see that symbol at the top, the little circle marked with 4.5V, it just means connected to the red wire, 4.5V. And there's a hole in the Arduino board marked 5 volts. Um, and some Arduino boards are marked VCC. Um, but that can actually be any voltage between 2.7 and 5.5, because that's just the voltage for the, um, the, Arduino, uh, the, the AT Mega 328P chip. Okay, so that's power, which is really important for all circuits. And then there's only two parts. And they're connected to, and it's marked there, D13. D stands for digital 13, because there are those pins at the bottom, which I briefly mentioned, which are analog pins. So those would be A0 to A5. But digital is what we want to use, and that's D0 through D13. Some projects, they'll just that they're not going to use an analog. But I put D13 there. So that's the pin with the built-in LED. And there's a wire going to the right. And then you see the, the, the zigzag, that symbol with the zigzag. That's a part. There's a left side and a right side. The left side of that part, it says 1K above it. The left side of that part has a wire connected to the D13 hole, pin 13 hole. The right side of that part has a wire going to the left side of that next part, which is, uh, what, a triangle with a little line, pointed to a little line. And then the right side of that part has a wire going down to that little triangle symbol with three lines. Mitch, Mitch, hold That's on. Is, ground. is it me or is it uh, your screen is frozen on the uh, presentation? Are you pointing, trying to point to your presentation, or? or um, your... I'm just trying to explain it because you can't see it on my phone. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, maybe you can see my cursor though. Can you see my cursor? Uh, see are people seeing the presentation? Because I'm not. It froze for me. Yes, I'm. I'm seeing the cursor move. Yeah, the cursor's okay, moving. Okay, yeah. Okay. There you go. Good. Okay, cool. So, again, I'll, I'll go through that again with the cursor. So, um, here's pin 13. It's marked here in light gray. Um, it can be any color. It doesn't matter. Um, but that's pin 13. Here's a line, meaning wire, going from pin 13 to the left side of this part. The right side of this part has a little wire going to the left side of this part. The right side of this part has a wire going down to this symbol, and this symbol is ground. So it means that this, the right side of this part has a wire connected to the black wire of our power supply, or one of the ground holes of our Arduino board. This is the electronic schematic symbol for a resistor, the zigzag. And this gives you the value of the resistor, 1K, 1,000 ohms. And that's brown, black, red. Um, 
and I'll I'll show you this uh, this a bit later. So um, this is the schematic symbol for an LED. An LED is a kind of diode. Oh yeah. So with a resistor, the zigzag. Imagine that you're an electron on a on an electron bicycle, a little electron bicycle, and you're having a fun time, and you're going on this wire here. It's totally smooth, and you're going from left to right, and suddenly this smooth pavement for my electron bicycle suddenly gets bumpy like this. It slows you down. So that's why the electronic symbol for a resistor is a zigzag. Mm -hmm. Electronic symbols usually show you how a part works or the way the part looks physically. In this case, it's how it works. It slows down electrons. OK, and then this is an LED. An LED is a diode, which is a one-way valve for electrons. Electrons can only go one way, which is why this looks kind of like an arrow pointing to the right. It goes from left to right, left to right. OK, so it's pointing to the right. And the way it, it points to ground, and you can see the, the minus ground side because the, it points to a little teeny minus sign. See the minus sign? It's, it's, it's sideways, but the cursor is going up and down. That's the minus sign on the right side built into the electronic symbol. Mm -hmm. So you know that this is the minus side of the LED. And this is also the symbol for a regular diode, but you can see, I don't know if you can tell here, but this, this is a really teeny little two lightning bolts pointing out of the LED. So that, that's what makes it an LED. It's got stuff coming out of it. It's supposed to be light coming up. OK, so the minus side has a wire going to ground. And the plus side is connected to one side of the resistor. The other side of the resistor goes to the pin 13 hole. So that, again, is just um, this. That's the schematic symbol for this. Well, I have a 10K in instead of a 1K, so it's really dim, but that's it. OK, so now let's look at that schematic for TV bomb, which is um, hopefully actually understandable now. It's not much different than um, what I just showed you. There's just a few more parts, plus some added information to be helpful. Um, down here, I showed resistors with their proper color-coded bands. I only showed two out of the three resistors shown. But here's a, 40, uh, a 10 ohm resistor and a 47 ohm resistor. And resistors can have two different styles for color code, a four band one and a five band one. So I showed it for each one. There's also a 1K resistor here. This is the schematic for TV Beyond, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so we have three resistors. Here's one on the left. There's two here on the right, 47 and a 10. This one here is 1K. Let's look at this part of the, the, the circuit first. So again, inside, there's the visible LED and the built-in resistor to keep magic scope from going away, going from pin 13 to ground that's built into the Arduino. Nothing coming out of the Arduino on pin 13. But here is pin um, D3. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, different number, D5. D5. And um, so pin five hole, we need a wire coming out to go to the top of a 1K resistor. The bottom of the 1K resistor has a wire going down to this symbol. What's that again? Ground. Yeah, so we have to connect it to the a ground hole of the Arduino board, somehow connected to the black wire of our parse supply. OK. so. There are, there's all these grounds. Usually they have grounds at the bottom, and here's these, two of these. Remember what this is? That's the red wire power. 
Okay, we got two of those. Um, so we got a red wire to power our Arduino, and this goes to the 5V hole uh, on my board. Some of them they say VCC. Um, and then the ground hole has the, my battery pack black wire, and then the, power, the board can be powered. And then I also have this resistor. But there's a little bit of information here about this resistor. If you're in Europe, you need this resistor. If you're not in Europe, you leave this resistor out. So EU is Europe, NA is North America. Mitch, would you mind? So uh, NA, no resistor. EU, use 1K. Mitch, can I ask you to? So that's the way to tell the uh, microcontroller with a controlling program um, to send out European codes or North American off codes because they have different sets of makes and models of TVs. Mitch, sorry, can you... So, uh, that's that part. Let's look at uh, this. Here's pin D2. There's a wire coming out of pin D2 hole going to the right side of this part. The left side of this part has a wire going... You've seen this before, ground. So we have to connect a wire of the left side of this part to a black wire of a power supply somehow, ground. And that'll be on the... This part is a switch. And remember a switch with my fingers, it's either on or off, on or off. looks like my fingers. <laughs> it was what actually goes on inside the switch. So we have the right side of the switch going to... <laughs> ...side of a 47 ohm resistor. The right side of the resistor goes to the B. That's a little team B here of this part. Mitch, can I ask the, you to a little e enlarge your screen? You can see it, but that's a little teeny E. The E lead of this part has a wire going to ground. Sorry, Mitch, Mitch, are you hearing are you hearing the request? I'm sorry? Mitch, uh, can you enlarge your he, screen? Hearing what? I guess he's not hearing me. Mitch, can you hear me? Paul wants to speak. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> Yeah, if someone can let Mitch know to uh, increase, like, put presentation mode, because it's hard to see the... Yeah, is there a way, Mitch, you can uh, put your PowerPoint software into presentation mode so we can see the current slide on the whole screen? I tried to do that before. before. Oh, um, let's see. Let me try again. Um, Okay, let me this and try again. So I think if you go to the slideshow menu within Google Slide within PowerPoint. Yeah, I don't see it showing up now. It was earlier when I was doing the uh, presentation. Let's see what happens now. I think um, on my computer anyways, there's some weird interaction which is slowing my computer way, way, way down. Um, so it's not, it's not showing the presentation. Hmm. It will catch up eventually, but like it slowed down my Arduino software as well. It's slowing mm -hmm. down. Does anyone see my PowerPoint presentation? Because I'm not, I don't. No. Not anymore. Yeah, and, uh, now it's taking a long time for the. Um, 
Well, let me go back here. Okay, now we see. Oh, this is good. Now it disappeared. <laughs> How about this? That's better. Okay, cool. That's that good. worked. Okay, so uh, here's my cursor again. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, so now you can actually see that it says C, B, and E. Mm hmm. So um, the E lead of this part has a wire going to ground. The B lead of this part has a wire going to one side of a 47 ohm resistor. The other side of the 47 ohm resistor goes to hole pin uh, hole D3, the pin three of our Arduino board. Then um, C lead goes to one side of a 10 ohm resistor. The other side of the 10 ohm resistor goes to one side of our infrared IR LED. Here's there's two sides. One side's plus and one's minus. Do you remember which side's minus and which is plus? Which is which? Big side's plus. Yeah, so the arrow points down in this, in the, in this case to the minus side. And here's a minus sign built into the electronic symbol. That's the minus sign. So it's the bottom, in this case, is minus. The 10 ohm resistor goes to the short lead of the infrared LED, the long plus lead goes directly to the red lead of the power supply through the power uh, solderless breadboard. Okay, again, here is um, the um, resistors, 47 ohm and 10 ohm, shown in both four band version color code and five band version. And um, <clears throat> the switch is two leads, left and right, but the actual switch is usually four leads. And you can see two at the top and two at the bottom. Internally, in these electronic parts, um, the, these two on the left are connected to each other inside the part. So either one, the top and bottom on the left, can be the left of the electronic symbol here, the left right here. The right side of the electronic symbol is either the top right or the bottom right. They're both connected to each other, no matter if you're pressing the button or not. Okay, but when you press the button, um, the left side and the right side uh, leads of the part connect to each other. And when you let go of the button, the two electronic, uh, the two pieces of metal are separated by that spring and they're not connected. Okay, so on your solderless breadboard, if you use a, a, a switch like this, make sure that the um, two leads are on the top and bottom and not on the left and right. Okay, and then this part, which I've never said what it was, is a transistor. And its name is 2N3904. And if you look online with 2N3904 in your favorite search engine uh, data sheet, then you get a data sheet with lots and lots of really interesting information that if you don't know electronics, you won't understand. But it'll show this picture, which shows you which of the three leads is C, B, and E. And that, again, stands for collector, base, and emitter. But um, and, and the schematic diagram up here with the transistor, um, you normally don't have C, B, and E written there. That's something you normally have to memorize. But I put it on here because I want this to be for total newbies, so you don't have to memorize anything yet. And I showed this picture here, so you don't have to search for a data sheet. It's already there to show you which is C, B, and E. And then I also put the schematic, which you usually don't have in a schematic for a project. I showed the schematic for the power supply battery pack. So there's a red wire. With a and there's a black wire, power, ground. This is the symbol for batteries, alternating long and short um, lines, and um, the longest line on top is plus. And then here's a switch built in, 
Um, yeah, so that's everything. And so I have now given you everything you need to know um, to um, make a TV be gone out of the parts that you have if you have the parts. And um, um, yeah, that's everything you need to know about electronics. <laughs> um, from my website uh, uh, page, uh, the, the, the workshop page, you can download this as a PDF so it's bigger. And um, you can also um, um, get the slides. And I can show you also the uh, Arduino, the minimalist Arduino. Yep. On these other slides here, which I haven't uploaded to my website yet, but um, I can. Uh, I think you can download them from this software. I can upload it uh, here to download. Is that possible? In the. I'll try it. So anyways, um, here, oh, I did want to show one other thing with the Arduino before going to the minimalist Arduino. Here's my Arduino board. It's being powered through the power supply uh, of my laptop through the USB port. And that's totally fine for many projects. But let's say I actually want to build a TV on. I don't want to bring my laptop with me to turn TVs off. So when if I unplug this, there's no more power. But I can take my battery pack. I can take the battery pack wires, and I can plug them into one of the ground holes. The black goes into one of the ground holes. And the red goes into the V in hole. Mm. And hey Mitch, are we safe just to pull out the um, connection from our laptop to the Arduino? Nothing. There's no like a check um, that you have to press. Um, and my Arduino board input voltage doesn't seem to be working, so anyways, um, it's an old Arduino port. It's been all over the world lots of times, so um, it's possible that um, it's, it's broken. But um, um, but you can just use that as a portable power supply. So I'm sorry, what was your question? No, I mean, I just wanted to try the uh, power supply. So am I, we, we can just, pull, can we just pull out the, the wire that connects your Arduino to your laptop to test it? There's no like, um, I don't know, like typically when you eject a USB, you like hit the eject button to make sure the thing blows up. Um, can we um, just pull it out and then hook up our uh, batteries to the Arduino? No problem. Wait, my um, my sound. I can like barely. Okay, so now you're back. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't. I I, I you were talking, but I didn't hear what you said. I was just wondering if I could just pull out this wire without doing any physical harm to the Arduino, um, so we can plug in the power supply and test out what you were saying. Yeah, that's exactly it. So there's a V in hole. And then there's two other ground holes. Uh, the VN is right next to one of the uh, two ground holes on the bottom of the uh, Arduino board. Got it. And then um, if you bought the parts, there's also a, um, um, a little USB connector that you can add uh, wires to um, with a soldering iron if it doesn't come with it. And then that can allow you to power from any USB power supply, not just your USB from your laptop. And the, the regular USB cable can, can also do that. So um, yeah, so let me show you now the um, uh, minimalist Arduino. Um, 
before uh, before I show you that, let me explain one thing with um, let's maybe uh, go back to kind of the top here with the uh, microcontroller. There we go, microcontroller. Um, so the microcontroller um, has memory in it. It has two forms of memory. Just like any computer. One form of memory is called RAM, random access memory. That um, is only available when the power is on. So anything you store in that, it's temporary memory. It's really fast, but it's temporary. So it's kind of like a scratch pad. Uh, if you do calculations on paper, it's kind of like the scratch paper for sort of keeping things, uh, uh, track of things in your head, um, helping you with uh, the numbers on the paper. So um, uh, the RAM can store all sorts of information, but when you turn the power off, it goes away forever. And then there's program memory. That's like the hard drive on your computer. So when you turn the power off, whatever you stored in the hard drive remains. Whatever you store in the program memory on your our, our, um, microcontroller chip on the Arduino board stays there. So if you program your um, Arduino board, you program the Arduino board with the Arduino software, and it's you know the LED blinking program or it's the gun program or whatever, it stays there for guaranteed up to 15 years. And then, uh, if you don't use it for 10 years and you plug it in again, that program will still be there and, it'll, and you turn it on and it runs. If you reprogram it, that program's gone forever, but the new program's there for up to 15 years. Um, and you can reprogram the Arduino program memory up to 10,000 times, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. The RAM lasts. Uh, you can reprogram that bazillions of times. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, so there's a small part of program memory that you need to have in there in order to use the Arduino software, and that's called the bootloader. The bootloader is a really small part of it, and it's a program. So when you first turn on the power, it actually doesn't go to setup in your sketch. The first thing it does is goes to the bootloader. And the bootloader then says, hey, is there a new cool program coming in from someone's laptop or whatever through the USB controller chip that uh, is for wiping out what's in my program memory to put a new cool program there? Or not? If there's a new cool program there, then I'm going to go into a special mode called programming mode, and then I'm going to wipe out program memory with whatever was there. I'm going to put whatever's coming in, the cool new program, in my program memory. Then, then it goes, then it, the bootloader is done, and then it goes to setup in your sketch. And then starts, it does that once, then it goes into loop and does that over and over and over again. If you then turn the power off, then you turn it on again, then it looks on, again, the bootloader, and the bootloader goes, hey, anything coming in on the USB controller chip? It's like, oh, no. So I'm just going to go to setup, do what's in there once, and then go down to loop and do that over and over again, when, you're, when the program that was already there. OK, so the chips, if you bought the parts, um, the chips, uh, we, bought, we ordered parts that have the bootloader, bootloader already in it. You can buy chips, and it costs a little bit more. Not much more, but it costs more because uh, it had to go through an extra process in the factory before they send it to the distributor. Um, you can buy, and normally you do buy, chips that are totally unprogrammed. And then you have to put a bootloader in it. And you do that with um, another piece of hardware and some, uh, but uh, no extra software because the Arduino software has the ability to program uh, bootloaders into a blank chip. Um, 
And I'm not going to go over that today, but there's good uh, tutorials online to show you. Instead of buying that special hardware, which costs about 20 to 35 uh, dollars or euros, um, you can program an Arduino to be that special hardware. And that's called a microcontroller programmer. <laughs> and um, the Arduino software um, is designed to be able to use that as well as one you would buy special. Okay, and there's tutorials on, online for that. And if you want to do that uh, anytime later and you have questions about it, totally feel free to uh, contact me, um, email or phone or whatever. And um, okay, but once the bootloader's there, you can use the Arduino software on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux and put any sketch in you like. And if you have parts connected to the pins that are appropriate for that sketch, the sketch will, will control those parts and something cool will be happening. Um, and if it doesn't, then you have to debug, which means you've got to be able to uh, practice that and get good at that. Uh, and that's not necessarily easy, but it's kind of frustrating, but it's really fun as well. It's all part of learning electronics. So let me show you the, um, the um, minimalist Arduino now. And I will let my computer um, catch up. Um, my phone is still showing the 18 mega 328p, but on my laptop I have a totally different slide up. What do you see? Uh, we see the, the chip. The chip, okay, so that obviously isn't working. Um, about now, oh well, maybe, maybe I gotta go back here. Nope, that seems fine. Wow, my computer is acting very funny, slow, and stuff. So, hmm. okay, so I'm going to cool my computer. <laughs> into doing the right thing by taking this information and, uh, oh no, I'm going to do this. Um, take these two slides, I'm going to paste them into the PowerPoint that's actually working. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. Yay, that worked. Um, OK, so um, this is just a diagram. Um, oh, but it's showing with a black background, and I want a white background, so it's hard to see. But um, hmm. OK, I'm going to try another way to fool my computer into doing the right thing. I'm going to take a screenshot which is also going really really slow <laughs> there it is um, and I'll do that okay now I can copy that Hey Mitch, when would you use the five volt or the three point three volt uh, power in for your Arduino? Well, at least mine has a five Excuse volt. Um, my yeah, the one that I that I ordered from you guys has a five V and a three point three V under the power section. Um, yeah. Now when that's would you use that? Out. Oh, that's power, that's power out. out. Yeah, so if you have uh, your Arduino board powered on, mm -hmm. then those are uh, a source of 5 volts and a mm, source of 3.3 volts. You got it. Or whatever you want. And then also uh, to the right of there are the analog input voltage um, mm. pins, which you can use for 
interesting things like that's usually for sensors in many projects um, or you can also use that for controlling other things which I do in some synthesizer stuff but uh, I don't really want to get really into that today that's another topic which is interesting but takes too long so um, so anyways now you can see um, this better here is a diagram showing you the minimalist Arduino with some optional stuff. Now, now you don't need all of this. So you don't need, um, let's see, can you see my, oh, let, let me try doing full screen with this and see if that works. Does that work? Let's see, let's go here and then go to here and then go here. Um, Where's the full screen? Um, there. Does that change? Yes. No. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not working. So um, I'll just have to do this screen. Um, so. Um, there we go. See it. Uh, I see people, but not my screen. Ah. Yeah. Cycling through. There you go. Okay, good. Um, there. There's a diagram, a little smaller than I'd like, but um, there's optional parts. Can you see my cursor moving around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going counterclockwise around. Yeah, good. So here is a red LED, and I have the plus side marked, and then a resistor. That's actually a 1K resistor. And then here's um, here's the chip. It's actually 80 mega 328P. Okay. Uh, this resistor and LED is the what's called built-in LED. That's the one on pin 13. So uh, an interesting thing with Arduino, um, pin 13 is not actually pin 13 of the chip. It's pin 19 of the chip. <laughs> and that's kind of confusing. There's a, um, let me go to another, oh, I don't have that here. Let me open this up. You can do a search for Arduino microcontroller mapping online to get this. But I, I can try uploading this too. So here is um, um, mapping, there it is. Oh, my computer's going so slow, sorry about this. Um, Well, wow, that's going slow. <laughs> okay, so let's not do that. Um, okay, so um, this just shows the pins of um, the computer chip, uh, the the microcontroller chip, eighty mega three two eight p. It's pin nineteen, and that is the Arduino pin thirteen. Um, there's various grounds here. They're really all the same. They're pins 8 and 22 together. Um, we have a ceramic resonator with three leads going to pin 9 and 10 with the middle lead going to ground. The built-in LED is optional, but it's really nice to have. So you can program it with Blink just to be sure everything's working. Um, Here's a power LED, and that's nice to have as well. Um, you know, it just goes from power to ground with a resistor, so no magic smoke goes away. Um, in this case, I have a green one. It can be any color. Um, this can be any color, too. But um, it's nice to have because it's nice to know if you have power or not. Um, and then we have power and ground, which can come from your battery pack. It can come from USB. 
And then another thing which you don't need, but it's kind of nice to have, is this reset switch. So it's just two leads, two of them from the top or the bottom, um, going to pin one in ground. And that's the whole thing. And then let me show you the same exact thing, but in schematic. And this shows that you don't need to have a really pretty schematic. Oops, what just happened? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay, um, you don't have to have a, a pretty um, drawing using software. This can just be on a napkin at a cafe, and I can be showing this to someone who speaks a human language that I don't even know. Um, <laughs> so, for instance, um, someone who speaks only Shanghainese I can speak some Mandarin and some Cantonese, but I cannot speak Shanghainese. So um, if they don't know English or German or any of the other languages I know or Mandarin, I can still draw this on a napkin and they will understand it if they know how to read a schematic. And it doesn't have to be pretty. So this shows not an Arduino. This rectangle here is the ATmega328P chip, and that's what it says in the middle here. It doesn't say Arduino, it says ATmega328P. This is the chip. And I, it has 28 pins, but I only show the pins that I need. But it looks really similar to what I showed you for the Hello World, um, except there's this extra part here. This is the schematic symbol for the ceramic resonator. It's got three leads. The middle one is ground. And then the other two, it doesn't matter. They go to pin 9 and 10, which the chip calls Xtel 1 and Xtel 2, which is short for crystal 1 and crystal 2. And a ceramic resonator is the equivalent of a crystal. So you just hook these three leads up, making sure that the outside leads go to 9 and 10, and the middle lead goes to ground. This is a little bit tricky, and I'll show you that in a sec. But you've already seen a switch going between a pin and ground, but on the Arduino. But this has to be on the solderless breadboard now. So pin one of the chip goes through a wire to one side of the switch. The other side of the switch has a wire going to ground. The red lead of the power supply goes to pin seven. The black lead goes to pin 8 and 22. There's a wire going from the red of our power supply to this side of the green LED and also to this side of this red LED. These are the plus sides. See the minus sign on the, r the left of each part? Mm -hmm. So the minus side goes to a resistor in each of these. Um, in this case, to um, oh, you know what? This schematic's wrong. I'm totally sorry. Um, this LED's um, it's not supposed to go here. It's supposed to go to ground, not to plus, because <laughs> this is going from plus to plus. So I, I mm -hmm. drew this incorrectly. This should be ground, not plus. I'll I'll fix that in a moment. Um, so the other side of the resistor goes to ground, not to plus five. Mm -hmm. But this side, the minus of the LED, the red LED, goes to one side of the resistor, 1K, the other side of the resistor to pin 13. Whole thing. And let me um, now try to show you this on my um, uh, phone. Here is. Oops. Um, hmm. My battery pack isn't working. Is that right? Yeah, I don't have enough power. What happened? Ah. It was working before, and I took the battery pack off to show you the battery pack. Um, there you go. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's not working anymore. Um, <clears throat> but let me show you um, what I did here. Um, I can try to debug that in a bit. But um, let's see. My laptop is totally funky. I can't see if. Um, let me turn up my volume here on the phone so I can tell what's going on. And turn the volume here. Okay, so where's the where's the video? Okay, so oh my laptop's back. That's good. Now I've got to turn the volume off, otherwise I've got feedback. Okay. Um, there we go. Oh, I get a preview. Uh, you can see my battery pack. The two leads. So these are where the um, these nice rows that are marked red plus and blue minus, where they can come in very handy. The Arduino, um, or the, the, the chip, has two pins. And if you look on the schematic again, pin 8 and 22, which have to be brown. So what I do is I take, um, oh, that's why it's not working, because pin, oh, no, it's working. So um, something else. Here is a wire on pin 8. Here's the chip. And one is over here. And then 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way to 14. And 15 is here, or 6 and 7, all the way up to 20, uh, 28. Pin 8 is right here, this uh, blue wire. And then that goes here to this blue, blue um, row, which is all minus because I have the wire from my power supply here going there. So all of these, these are different than these. These work in rows. This entire row, this blue minus row, is now brown. My red wire, I put up here for my power supply. Oh, here. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is for my power supply. Mm -hmm. And I have that going in this red plus row, and so this entire red plus row is all plus. So like here's a wire connected there. This is a wire going to plus. Here's another wire going to plus, and that goes to one side of my blinking LED. And uh, this other one goes to power of my microcontroller, which is pin 7, which is over here. Here's the switch. You can see the um, two leads at the top here. Where's uh? Here we go. This. Oh, wait, where uh, where did it go? Oh, here. <laughs> okay. Here's my two leads pointing up for the switch, and here's the two leads pointing down. They're not connected to anything, but they are connected in the switch to the top ones. So, um, so I can ignore those. This is the left side of my switch. This is the right side. And the right side's going to pin 1. The left side's going through this wire to ground. So the switch works. Watch what happens to the LED when I push the switch. As long as I keep that push, the, the switch pushed, it's being reset, so nothing happens. If I let go, it resets, and now it starts doing the program that I programmed it for, which is just blink. The green LED just goes, one side goes to um, plus. Yeah, this is <laughs> awkward. <laughs> yeah, it goes to plus. 
The other side of the LED goes through a resistor to, um, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> this side's going to ground. This side is going to ground, the blue ground row. Uh, and then this side is going through a resistor to plus. Let me see, can I? On my screen, everything's backwards. That's why it's so cumbersome. You mm -hmm. can see. Um, so um, it's in the plus row. And then, um, yeah, that's the minimalist Arduino. I also have these two capacitors here, which are nice to have, but not required. Let me see if I can get that. Yeah. So these, this is a big capacitor. It has a long and a short lead. The long is going to uh, pin seven. The short to pin eight, which is power and ground. And here's a little capacitor going in parallel to the same pins, just across power and ground. This is a hundred microfarads. Micro is a millionth. And this is 0.1 microfarads. And that's just kind of standard for all electronics. Whenever you have a power supply, it's nice to have 100 microfarads and a 0.1 microfarad. I didn't put that, I did not put that in the schematic, but I do have it here. It works totally fine without it. But, see the LED? He is still blinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the batteries will just last a little longer. And if you have other stuff going on in your circuit that are drawing like lots and lots and lots of LEDs blinking, it's kind of nice to have those capacitors so that the microcontroller doesn't get noise. Uh, uh, with lots of LEDs turning on and off, that can put noise in my power supply wires here, which can then put noise in my chip, which can then make things mess up occasionally. So that's why it's nice to have those, but you don't need it. And then and the power LED, I can take that away as well. I can take away the um, reset switch, but I cannot take away the um, ceramic resonator. So let me try to go in here to show you what's happening with the ceramic resonator. Um, let me pull it out first. If I pull it out, you'll see that the LED stopped blinking. But here's, here's the part. Mm -hmm. okay. And those leads are kind of bent funny. Um, I, I'm <laughs> this is really hard to do. <laughs> um, so, um, where's my camera again? Oh, it's over here. So, um, there we go. And it gets kind of blurry as I get too close, but you can see the three leads. The, the one in the middle needs to go to ground. The two on the outside go to pin nine and 10. And I bent the ground lead up. Can I get that to focus somehow? Um, that's hard to see. Um, although now, since everything's backwards on my screen, it's pointing down. Okay. Um, right. So even without that ground, so I put this in. You want to make sure that the ceramic resonator goes into pins 9 and 10 very close to the microcontroller because those are very sensitive. These are actually analog. There's very, very low current and very, very low voltages. And if they're too far away, then the 60 hertz or 50 hertz from your AC wall um, might start becoming more powerful and overpowering the small signal from your ceramic resonator or crystal. So you have to make sure those wires are very short. 
and it even works without the um, uh, I'm trying to get that um, back in without the ground middle lead being connected. Can you see the uh, ground middle lead here? It's just kind of hanging there. But if you want to guarantee that it'll work every time you turn it on, you've got to connect that to ground. And what I did is I bent that pin eight is ground, so I can just bend this and make sure it touches, <laughs> and, then it's, and then it's always working. But if you want to make sure that it's always working super well, it's good to solder mm -hmm. a short wire to that middle lead and then connect it to um, the uh, ground pin in the solderless breadboard, which is right next to it at pin eight. OK. So um, I don't know if all of you are uh, uh, know how to solder. Um, that's something that I teach a lot, but I don't think we have time for that today. <laughs> so, oh, um, um, but uh, my comic book shows how to do it. And um, uh, it'll probably work without it, but it would be nice to just try adding a, an extra small piece of wire that's about um, one centimeter long, which is like a quarter inch, uh, quarter inch to a half inch long, um, and um, and then it'll always work if you connect that to ground. And, and is the is the trouble upon startup or trouble will, upon startup or will it fail on you maybe after some time if if you don't um, have that work. ground. Um, if you don't have that ground, some ceramic resonators will work, perhaps all the time, definitely some of the time. <clears throat> some ceramic resonators might not work so well. There might be some, uh, it might work most of the time except when you have a motor running in the next room <laughs> or things like that. Yeah. So. Um, so it's nice to have that. Another option is instead of a ceramic resonator, you can have a crystal and then you need, with a crystal, you need to have two small capacitors of a particular value. And those are 12 picofarads going from pin nine to ground and pin 10 to ground. Um, picofarad is a billionth of a billion. So a billionth of a billion, 10 to the minus, uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, 10 to the minus 18. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, anyways, pretty much, uh, pretty much everything. So thanks for all of that. That was a lot of time. That was a lot of information. <laughs> That was uh, hopefully a lot of cool stuff that gives you a feeling for how this stuff works. You definitely can um, make your minimal Arduino. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't tell you how to program it. So to program it, you need to take the chip out of the board. And you can do that with a small screwdriver. The power off. So I'll turn the power off. Power off. Take a small screwdriver and you can, or a toothpick, and then you can pry this carefully out using both sides. Now I have my chip. Okay, and again, I showed you a picture, but here's here's the actual chip with, with um, get, get the light shining in it correctly. There we go. You can see um, here mm -hmm. in one, and the uh, uh, indented half circle here is the top of the chip, and um, to the uh, 
top of that is uh, to the left of that is pin one, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, all the way to fourteen, and then down here is fifteen, all the way up to twenty-eight. Here. Okay, and then here's an Arduino board with the same chip in it, and you can see the um, indention. Here's uh, wow, that's hard to do with <laughs> double mirror. Um, here's pin one. That's the indention, and then here's the half circle. So you got to make sure everything's oriented correctly um, and you can take your screwdriver here here you've got to be careful um, put that in here and just kind of wiggle a little and then I'll do the other side and wiggle a little mm. wiggle a little bit and then you go back and forth and if a cat is not on your keyboard, then you get to see what you're doing. And, um, and then you can um, pop the chip out. <laughs> Cat <laughs> willing. And um, and then here's the chip that's no longer in the Arduino board. You can see the Arduino board without the chip. That's a socket. And then you can put the new one, or your, your um, minimal Arduino one, in there in the correct orientation. And now it's ready to be programmed. Just like before, except now there's a different chip in there <laughs> with either <laughs> no program or an old program that needs to be overwritten. And, um, yeah, and you do that the same as before. And you don't have to redo the tools menu with those two setup things, because it's the same board and the same driver, the same port and all that. You just click the upload button, and it'll do its thing, normally in a quarter second instead of a minute, like it's doing on my computer, which is <laughs> um, Firefox. And this software is playing weirdly on the computer, so I'm sorry about that. But um, yeah, that's it. Oh, cool. I hope that sense. Do you have any questions on that or anything else? Sorry? I hear someone talking, but I can't understand you. Is that... Um, uh, Duke. Yeah. I see that Duke's talking, but I can't understand you, unfortunately. Can you try again? Darn. Um, hmm. No, I'm still talking. Hopefully, it will start coming through. Um, is anyone else on this one? I can, I can hear you now. Uh, great. Um, so my question, I got mine working, actually. I pried it off the board, and it's, uh, it's blinking. I got him. Awesome. Um, but how do I know where to put the capacitors? Ah, uh, yeah. So the capacitors. Um, let me um, show the capacitors here. Okay, so here are the capacitors. Okay, so this is 100 microfarad, and these capacitors also have a voltage rating. If you use a capacitor with too small of a voltage rating, they'll burn out. But we're only using 5 volts, so you really don't have to worry about that. So we definitely need a capacitor that's more than 5 volts. These, they usually come in 25 or 50 volts, so you don't have to think about it, but I um, just thought I'd point that out. Out. So this is 100 microfarad. You can see there's a long lead. Oh, that's magnetized. You can see there's a long lead. 
and the short lead. The short lead, just like a is minus. This is a 0.1 microfarad. Both leads are um, the same length. It doesn't matter which way you put that in. Just put that across the power supply, and the best place to put it is near the chip. So the chip is normally on the board um, here. No, I didn't plug it back in, but the, the chip's normally on the board here with pin one. Yeah, like that. And then I can put these right next to the, um, let's see, yeah. I'm do that that way. Where is power on, um, oh yeah. So here is power, red wire. Here, here is ground, in this case, blue wire. And that's power is this column going into pin seven. Ground is this column going into pin eight. So just stick this stick this um, two leads into pin seven and eight, right next to the chip. Oh yeah. So and it then likewise this one, likewise this one. So just make sure that the long lead is in the plus. It, it doesn't uh, short it out. Do that with power off. <laughs> Can you just put it across the red and blue rows on top of the board? Or you have to put it close to the chip. You can do that. Chip. Yeah, you can do it um, pretty much anywhere. But it's nice to do it next to the chip, where it will short out noise at the chip, which is, which is where we need it shorted out. But doing it right at the red and blue wires from the power supply is also okay. If you have a large, like um, uh, this is a relatively small product with not too many parts. If you have parts, it's kind of complicated. It's nice to have, um, in addition to the 100 microfarad and the 0.1 microfarad, to just intersperse 0.1 microfarads between power and ground all over the board. And that shorts out places on the board where noise might get into the circuit where you don't want it. Because digital is only digital um, if there's no noise. And the capacitors help you keep the digital as digital and not looking like analog. If noise gets on a digital line, it starts looking more like analog, which messes things up. We want only high or low with voltage or not voltage. If there's noise, then you get in-betweens, and then digital circuits start kind of getting confused. And that's why the capacitors are helpful. And um, it's not so much a purely rational process on how to do that. Um, so electrical engineers always just intersperse point ones between power and ground throughout the board, whether it's solderless or solder. Hmm. What's and um, they're really, really cheap parts. So adding a few here and there never hurts anything, and it can help. So with our minimal Arduino board, you don't need it. It'll work fine without it, like I said before. But it's kind of good to get in the habit of using those. You just need one 100 microfarad. And um, for this one, we only need one. Um, you don't actually need. It's nice to have one 0.1 microfarad. Uh, and in more complicated projects, have um, a few or several um, 0.1 microfarads. Mm -hmm. 
can I also ask, what's the, what's the maximum power transistor you can drive off the minimalist Arduino directly without using any gate drive circuits? Like, how much power can you pump out of this Arduino or control through this Arduino? So the uh, um, uh, I can't remember. You have to look in the data sheet, and I did that, but it's been a while, so I forget. But I think each pin can supply 20 milliamps, which is a 20 thousandths of an amp, which is 0.02 amps, which is, you know, not too bad. And if you're just blinking a visible LED, that's totally fine. Like if you're doing RGB LED strips, that works totally fine. But if you're doing something like TVB gone where you need a really bright infrared light um, in order to shine at TVs to turn them off, they need pulses of an amp. So 0.02 amps will work, it just won't go very far. And so that's why I have the current amplifier, the transistor, for the TV be gone. But you definitely don't need it just for blinking um, colored lights uh, that look cool. You will need something, though, if you want to have a motor that moves any something with any amount of weight at all. Um, the motors need more current to have torque, which is the amount of um, uh, rotational energy for moving things. And um, so for that, you need a motor driver as well. And that's a little more complicated than just one transistor. But um, uh, there's projects online that you can just download and copy for that as well. So um, again, that's a little more uh, complicated to to explain with the background information we have now, but not, not all that much. So if, if you have time and you're interested in doing things that move, um, definitely download a project that, that has motors and try copying it. And then um, there's other sites that show, that explain how that works. And I'm happy to just do that offline uh, if you have questions as well. Uh, I have a question. Um, I noticed that uh, with that uh, in the uh, bill of materials uh, for the um, uh, for the minimalist Arduino, uh, it included a um, uh, a USB um, connector. Uh, is that is is there? Let's see. Is that how we would? Um, if, is there some alternative way to to program it uh, using this? No, um, but there is a way to do it using one of these, or a quick okay. one. There's a lot of uh, different ones, like I said, this just has a, um, I don't know, you can sort of see the USB controller chip underneath there. Okay. Um, you just need a board with a USB controller chip, and then this has the correct pinout. It's a six pin thing, there's power ground, custom pins on the microcontroller that put it into programming mode, and then um, you download the driver for that USB controller chip, and then tell your uh, Arduino software that you can use that. And like here, this board, and many, many other Arduino clones, don't have USB controller chips on them. But with this board and its cable, you can plug it in in the correct way into here, and now it's ready to have this plugged into your USB of your, your computer, and then you can use the US uh, the Arduino software to program it. But if you have an Arduino clone like this, which has the USB the controller chip here. Mm. That's this. And it's got its own uh, USB connector here. <laughs> and all you need is this regular cheap old um, USB cable. <laughs> and then plug this into your laptop. Um, but you need to take out your um, um, chip from your minimalist Arduino setup and then plug it into 
here, then you can use this board to program with your Arduino software. And then take this chip out and put it back in here once you're done. So yeah, many, many options. But to have a pretty minimal Arduino with pretty much just a chip, <laughs> and you can add more parts to make it nicer, um, it's without a uh, USB controller chip. OK, that answered my question. Thank you. Yeah. I'm curious from a debugging point of view. Uh, I, I mean, I <laughs> having to wait for the loop to load the thing to see if it works is pretty slow. So is there a simulation or a, or a debugging workflow that could help with the feedback loop to understand that what you're putting together makes sense? Right. So well, unfortunately, with Arduino, uh, there's not much of a debugging environment. With, um, <clears throat> with more professional kind of um, microcontroller development boards, which is all that was available in the old days. And it was always proprietary software that ran only on Windows. Even though it was free of cost, it wasn't free as in freedom. Um, but you know, there, there, there were many things. And you can buy software like that for 18 mega 328 chips, um, but not with the Arduino environment. So to debug, um, normally it is just a quarter second to, to put another program in. Um, and you can, with the Arduino software, put in print statements, which is how um, software engineers often debug. So they, and it'll print out to a special window on your laptop um, called a, um, um, a serial monitor. So your Arduino board talks with serial um, through USB controller chip to your laptop and there's a, a window you can open up from the Arduino software, the uh, serial monitor window, which will display anything that you use a print statement for. And so if you have a complicated program um, that has like a bunch of inputs or timing that you're doing and um, you can print out like the values of variables to the to the serial monitor to your screen, and then you can see what's happening in your software. On your hardware on the board, you can add an extra LED um, with a wire, an extra wire, and then have uh, on another output pin, and that output pin can be lit whenever something happens. And then you can tell if that part of the software, or of your firmware rather, uh, your controlling program, you can tell if that part of your firmware is reached under certain conditions. Like I can say, uh, blink this, uh, you know, I want to, I have a program, let's say uh, music synthesizer, I've got 12 buttons, and depending on what button is pushed, I get a different frequency. But when I actually try to use it, uh, it's not making good sounds. It's like not going do, 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 do. instead it's doing <laughs> um, so I can I can look in my um, I can I can add an extra statement in my firmware to blip an LED just go on off and then um, uh, whenever I'm in a particular part of the program and that can give me clues as to a bug in my firmware. Um, yeah, and then bugs in hardware are another story. So it takes a lot of practice to get good at debugging with both programs and with hardware. With hardware, usually what goes wrong is two things that should not be touching or touching. Um, and quite often, it has something to do with power. So if you have something like this, this is a, a, a digital meter, and it can measure all those dead physicists, volts, ohms, and amps. So usually with power supply, you can just measure 
we got red, red, and red and black here. You can measure the volts and see if it's correct. You can measure it from your battery pack directly, and then at the other end of the battery pack, you can measure the voltages on your board. You can measure it at the chip, and um, all the places where you're supposed to have voltage, you can see if the right power supply voltage is there. And in debugging hardware that um, it's the first time you put it together, chances are you didn't do everything perfect and everything has to be perfect. Um, chances are you can find out what's wrong by just measuring the voltage everywhere there's supposed to be vo voltage. And if it's there, cool. If it's not, well, then you, then you found your problem. Also, it's really easy on these boards, since there's lots of rows and columns of holes, to have just one over too many on the left or, or the right. <laughs> And also, parts of these leads that are pretty small. And so, is that showing up? Um, yeah, they're pretty small. So um, it's easy for them to connect when you don't want them to. So it, you have to go in there with a small thing and separate them. Thanks. So those are some, some tips and tricks. But that's really what debugging is. It's a bunch of tips and tricks. And after you have practice, you, just, you see what works for you. And there's no, like, here's what you do. Step one, step two. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And if you've ever tried to debug a program, you know that like, there's some sort of heuristic rules of thumb that you can go through to try to debug things. But everyone has their own styles and what works for them better. And that's, that's good. So same with same with the hardware. It's just with practice, you see what works for you uh, better. All right. Well, sounds uh, no more questions. I think any more questions or. This is good for now. That was a long day. One month to come. So thanks for sticking with it, and um, I hope I hope that was useful. <laughs> Sorry, who had? Was there a quick one at the end? Yeah, right. I just want to say to Paul, who asked about the debugging. There's an Arduino simulator program called Tinkercad. I just put it in the chat. You might want to look to see if that meets your needs. I'll look into it too. That's very cool. That's thank the first time I've heard of it, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, and also, let me see if I can upload. Um, let's see, where's the chat? Um, hmm. Chat, there it is. So I have not been able to uh, look at the chats as people were um, doing stuff, unfortunately, so sorry about that. Um, but is there a way that I can? Upload a file to this chat that everyone can download. Um, to this chat, not specifically, but you can e email that to me. I can post post that to everybody. We have the okay. wiki. I don't so know I you, will, yeah. I'll email you the. Um, uh, it, it's just a really short PowerPoint with two uh, with two slides for the minimalist Arduino. Yep. And then you can just do that. And then, um, oh yeah, and let me put the link, the link for, um, um, where's my cursor? There we go. Let me put the link in the chat for um, the Arduino for Total Newbies workshop page, just so everyone has that. Um, Tiny.cc slash A4TN. Make sure I did that right. Yeah, that worked. Okay, I'll put that in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Except that it's working slowly as well. Um, there it is. Did that work? <laughs> okay. 
There it is. <clears throat> Tiny.cca4tn. Do people see that? Yep. Yes, tiny dots. Yes, tiny dots. Yeah, cool. All right. Great. And yeah. um, and I'm totally serious. If you have any questions on anything, um, um, please ask. And if I can help, I will. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you much so much. Maybe. Yep. I always hear so for. This is a lot of uh, fun to like, people with all these things and, and whatnot. Um, okay, my question is, imagine you stumble upon something that you want to replicate. Uh, what what would you suggest as a, okay, now compact create this thing somehow so that other people can use the device, the little product that you put together? What's the, what's the next step once you know that you have something that works and you want the next person to just get one as opposed to building with themselves. Yeah, so that first schematics come in. You know, plus you the more documentation you give, the better. So you you give a schematic for how the um, board is laid out, and um, you know you can take pictures and whatever. But then it's hard to see underneath wires. So doing the schematic, and you can do it. Um, you can do it um, just with a quick sketch. It doesn't have to be super pretty. And then take a picture of that or scan it, uh, a sketch. And then you can upload that. If you want it to be pretty, you can spend more time at it. Um, you know, and like, like, I made a mistake in, in my sketch, and I caught that before distributing it. I'll, I'll fix that before giving that to uh, Marcin, and he can um, give that to everyone else. Um, but yeah, that's the hardware. And then the uh, the firmware is super easy. You just um, copy and paste. <laughs> so uh, that can be a place that anyone can download then. And then it's nice to have not only comments in your sketch, but also a document that describes any aspects of the um, any aspects of the project which might not be obvious. So you can say, Hey, what you were thinking about, why you did it. Uh, you can say a little bit about yourself. Even you can, um, you can have a picture of your cat. You can um, 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 uh, get an overview of any kind of theory, which might be helpful for people who want to use your project, uh, understand your project, and also for people who want to use your project a little bit differently, so they can uh, um, modify it more readily, more easily. And give away for people to share back with any improvements or changes. And so I, I use GitHub. Um, I've been using that way before Microsoft opened it. Now GitLab might be a better choice since they're more open. Um, there's other places that are common for people to upload stuff. Or, or you can just use your own um, website with whatever software works for you. Yeah, and as far as digital design for some of this this uh, electronics, we do have a couple of videos actually, which we haven't released yet, on the minimalist Arduino and how you actually go through designing that in KiCad, the open source electronics design software. So we can actually pass that on. Those are some recent videos from some of our people, uh, so we can also share that with you guys. Basic lesson on KiCad literacy. To turn a complete loop of open source tools here yeah so I can pass that on but yeah other than that thank you Mitch so so much for your your time and making this happen that's I think that's really useful and um, we'll continue on hacking yeah. we'll have, have uh, fun with the rest of the um, presentations and projects yep. and You'll all soon have some cool printing action happening, <laughs> and, and you'll know how and why it works, which is even cooler. Yep, yep. Thanks, Mitch. And for anyone else who wants to stay on a little bit, we can also discuss any of the 3D printer build and the curriculum that's still out there. So thanks again, Mitch. And we'll, yeah. we'll do it. Well, thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Mitch.
Gracias. Ciao. Ciao, Mitch. Take care. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was a full day of electronics there. Um, yeah, so where do we go from here? So does anyone ha has anyone actually started to unpack and build their printer? All oh, right, right. Uh, any any questions on it that I can answer so far? Because the, the idea is, I think the, the build guide, which uh, if you go to, let me share my screen, actually, I can... Uh, show you what we have on the resources there but uh, the universal 2 build guide so that we have a development page for the d3d universal it's actually formally known as v20.07 standing for the year 2020 that's july this is when this was produced but the build instructions right here they're pretty comprehensive the the guide on the main build uh you can click on that and go into the edit mode and the extruder they're pretty thorough um if you want to take a look at, um, for example, the, and also if you want to take a look at it to see what what the build is actually like, there's it's a pretty exhaustive uh, manual that, let's see, view present. I'll just go through a few pages of it, but it's pretty much walks you A through Z on the, on the whole process. Um, so starting, I mean, it's it's interesting in a sense that you've got the the bed build from the actual Nichrome heater wires. Uh, packaged up to this nice small bed with a high performance form, performance PEI surface. And you've got all the axes, the universal axis, how you build one, two, and three of them. Um, but the basic idea being that the printer itself is, um, you can think of it as the most basic kind of a design with just three axes, whereas the, the next printer up, it's got a different kind of a configuration with five axes, two Z axes and two Y axes, whereas this is just a simple X, Y, Z kind of a system. Uh, but it does have our own extruder, the, D, the D3D, the universal gearless extruder for three three millimeter and 1.75 millimeter filament. And yeah, the instructions are, I think, pretty comprehensive if you want to go through that to see what it's like. Uh, you should be able to, if you have these instructions, pretty much go through the entire, um, I mean, there's like 159 pictures to the final final step of everything. And then the only thing you might have trouble with is how to connect everything together. There's We do have some uh, basic, uh, in, a, in a build manual, so in a build instructions, there is a uh, step, at, there's steps at the end for how you do the wiring. Uh, I don't think it was captured well in the manual. I think you might might have to add a couple of pages but we do have um, a number of pages like for example uh, on the universal d3d universal the original one there was we had a uh, so if you go here build instructions build Ooh, procedure uh, I'm not sure how well, I can I mean, maximize it but on the uh, on the d3d universal build uh, you, you also have a whole section on the, the electronics and controller and then a first run procedure and so forth. So it's pretty decent, um, but probably like one, I would say, I would say probably once you get through the, uh, most of the physical build, you can touch back with me on, on the electronics, I can walk you through it. Um, the other thing is the real fun comes in when you can use FreeCAD and then you can print design and print using your printer so we can also have a uh, I'd like to do a basically in one hour I can teach you how to do this basic workflow which involves if you can draw a feature upon a feature a geometrical feature upon a geometrical feature which is constructive geometry you can pretty much design any kind of a an object whether it's a tractor or like the the carriage, the 3D printer pieces and all that, uh, through a very basic workflow where you start start with two dimensional shapes, you extrude them into 3D, and then you can draw further additional shapes that are either additive or subtractive, like holes or features. And with that kind of a basic workflow in FreeCAD that I can teach you in about an hour, you, you should be able to do like 80% of any kind of CAD design. So uh, that's something to uh, definitely you'd want to learn. Uh, but we can set that up whenever you guys are ready for that lesson. Uh, so that that's with the program. I wanna I wanna share that with everybody. 
who's here and who's building the printers so you can design your own files of any any kind of size and shape and also modify the existing parts if you want to make any additions or modifications to the current current designs where we of course welcome you to um, to make modifications it's all open source and also if you want to take your printer to I have an open invitation that if you want to produce parts for us go right ahead the printer the universal itself will allow you to make parts for more printers and we can buy them from you at at the basic production production cost which is like um, at basically at the same cost as, as we would sell the parts so we can involve in a little bit of entrepreneurial activity uh, if you want to start part printing and things like that, we'll take them from you because uh, you know we can print them. We can take them from others who want to print them, so we can have uh, distributed manufacturing in its true true form. Uh, but with that said, um, uh, how about the FreeCAD session? Uh, when would you guys want to want to have that in the near future? Whenever. Uh, would you recommend having it uh, doing the session once everyone has built their printer or before? Because I haven't oh. even eaten. Yeah, I would probably say, not necessary. Uh, after you build your printer, you definitely have a drive to say, okay, now I want to do some files. So I, I would definitely suggest build your printer and then when you're ready to, to design things for printing. Um, but mm -hmm. it could be either way. I mean, um, we can set, say something like maybe, so you <laughs> also, also put a little urgency, maybe like, you know, say something in a couple of weeks. Maybe give you enough time to. Um, I mean, the build itself yeah, should build it. take you uh, anywhere between eight and twenty-four hours, depending on how how good you are. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then if you spread it along many days, you can keep your, you know, take your. You can do it at your own pace. Um, but I would suggest I don't know something like in a couple of weeks from now, maybe do the session or. Or if not, maybe a little later, but something like two weeks gives you at least good time to start and for some of you to finish it, so you're ready for uh, for design work. And if you're not ready for design work yet, it's you can still take the lesson mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. start generating your own 3D prints as soon as you've got your printer running. So something like that. I would I would suggest maybe like two weeks from now, on Saturday, uh, go at a session like 1 p.m. or so, uh, something like that. That sounds good. Do that. Yeah, yeah, do that. That. yeah, let's do that. Um, does anyone have any questions on? I know we we're missing a couple. Like the for some reason we shipped like one instead of two of the heater wires. Uh, I'll send that out. Ray, any any questions on your side? A couple quick ones. So I'm I kind of am mocking this up here. The heater bed, right? So it's like yeah, be the bottom plate, yep. and then the top plate, and then the heater elements in between sandwiched in exactly and then we have these bars right yeah that, that that go here yep to all around the four edges exactly. now did those bars just get held in place by the tension of the screw yeah exactly so because there's also another piece that is the carbon fiber blanket which is uh the insulating square that's six by six inches here it is so if you look at my machine right here, yep, that is squishy. So when you when you pinch it with the bolt, it holds mm. it and it holds it in place so nothing falls out. It's an effective way to get a nice sandwich in a small form factor. Great, great. And yeah. then um, as far as these nylon um, sleeves or whatever yeah. we call them. Fiberglass um, sleeves, yep. Fiberglass, sorry, fiberglass sleeves. Um, we're supposed to kind of have... So I was I received two lengths and yep. one is one is three feet the shorter one is three feet and the longer one is three feet and change yeah and I so I'm supposed to cut the long one into a two foot length and then the two short lengths that's correct so the way it works is you wrap the nichrome around the inner sleeve that's only two feet so you got a two foot about you know that's about that much you're gonna basically coil that up into the heat bed but. As far as the wire itself, you got like nine feet of wire exactly. Uh, so, you got, so you're gonna wa wrap it around. You can do it by hand, or you can put it in a cordless drill and kind of wrap it if, if you know how to do that. But just that take you like 15 minutes by hand. Um, so you're shrinking that nine feet into like a two foot se segment to make it manageable. And then we want to basically be leaving the, the very thin wire off of both sides to loop around the hooks on the exactly. The, 
wire? Yes, and you don't solder them because that heater element is going to be very hot. It would melt solder. Like solder melts at like 300 C or whatever. So you're not going to be, you're just going to wrap it around nicely um, around the, the fence wire. Uh, I would suggest so get yourself some so, uh, sandpaper, just um, sand it a little bit to get any any dirt off it. But just wrapping makes a good connection. It's solid. Like once you wrap that wire around it, it's pretty firm. Just get a bunch of little wraps around it. Uh, right. No solder. No solder there. This is the fence wire here. Yep. Is that the fence wire is the end piece? Yes. Yes. That's. Uh, right. Yep. Yep. And make a hook, make a little hook so you can, uh, like a small hook at the very end, like it's already got, right? Yeah, this was came like this, yes. Yep. Uh, so you can wrap the nichrome around that and that won't come off. Uh, but, like I, why I said you got a three foot piece of um, fiberglass sleeve, cut like two six inch sections at the end. Mm -hmm. So that you, you slip them onto the, the end so you're protecting the ends from... Uh, you basically cover up the fence wire so you don't get a short circuit. Yeah. Under. Got it. I got yeah. it. Thank you. And that then makes sense. when you're winding it through, you'll notice that the fiberglass sleeve is rather loose, so you can easily poke through it with the nichrome. So when you wrap, make the first wrap around, I would even like uh, put like tape, probably put tape around the edge so you're not going to go through the, the braid of the actual sleeve because it's really easy to go through that because it's a loose braid. Uh, so make I sure see. it goes all the way through without poking through, uh, without like going outside the braid and then coming back in because that's going to be a short circuit. Uh, now the safety feature on this thing, we are including a GFCI uh, power supply circuit breaker. So if that in does indeed does happen and you touch it, you're safe from that kind of thing. Uh, but we do have a GFCI. I was just looking up at, at statistics for how many people get electrocuted by household appliances. It's about 200 people per year. Um, so uh, that's why we have the, the, the GFCI, the ground fault connection interrupt, which means that if you touch it and some current goes through you, that thing will shut off within milliseconds and so you don't get hurt. But that's a good safety feature. Uh, but otherwise, that bed, it has... a um, um, it's pretty much insulated because the top of it is is the plastic, the PEI uh, print surface, and a, and the way it's mounted on a bed, it's also through insulators. Like the four bed mounts, they're insulated, so uh, it's pretty much like if there's a short in there, you'll probably see your bed fail, uh, but you're not gonna you're not like causing a dangerous condition where everything is elect electrified but if you in case you do touch anything that you shouldn't there's the GFCI that's uh, the protective feature on it but I would say like if you're if the heat bed is running I don't touch it I mean it's gonna be hot for one um, but if you want to keep super safe don't touch don't touch the heat bed when it's on if you want to be super safe about any kind of shock risk or anything um, and then yeah. uh, when, we, when we turn off the machine, um, what kind of cool down time should we respect before we get, you know, before we go and well, interact with it? The cool down, the bed will heat down by itself, so there's nothing that, that you can melt with that. As far as, you don't need to, you can shut it off pretty much immediately because the parts will just cool down by themselves. Like, uh, for example, the heater, the, the hot parts are the heater, the, the extruder heater block which uh, the only thing you have to, for any meltdowns, you just gotta make sure that your, your cooling fan on the front of the machine, this fan here is running. Because otherwise, if it's not, you're gonna get a clog, like basically the heat will travel throughout the entire extruder and potentially melt some, some things down. So just make sure that whenever the printer's running, that fan is on, otherwise, because um, mm. that's the big heat sink for the entire extruder assembly. That's the, uh, this is the, the heat sink, the metal heat sink right there. Um, mm -hmm. But the fan is mounted below it through a, another heat sink below that. So that fan's got to be running for you not to like m have a meltdown. Um, and a meltdown would mean that like, I don't know, maybe your, uh, some of the plastic might deform somewhere 
but that's just like the only thing for danger like the the heat bed is at 120 as far as the um, as far as the uh, heater element in the extruder that's 24 volts so that's safe uh, that's DC but the 120 AC is good because then you can yeah um, see the why we went with the 120 the design rationale is there you can use a tiny power supply like this little power supply here uh, mm -hmm. Just one of those tiny power supplies gets you a fast, high-performance heated bed because you're running it through a because you're running the otherwise the 120 AC through the solid-state relay that's in the back there. You see that solid-state relay? That's what's handling the power. So you don't need the, a big power supply. You can just use wall power and just turn it on and off. So that's a smart. I would say it's a smart design for not use, not having like a big, otherwise you just need a regular big power supply. One of those mm -hmm. things here, you can get away with a tiny one uh, and still have high performance. And then I couldn't figure out which piece this is. Yeah, so that is the piece that you see, it. that's where the filament goes into it. That's under the, that's oh. the fan. That's the block. That's the main heat sink, which takes the heat from the heater block below and you do on all the cooling through that block so that, that mounts directly on the extruder that's part of the extruder but the details there are in the extruder like let me share my screen just to show you that but that should be pretty clear in the extruder build so in the extruder <laughs> the main heat be, sink yeah so okay so in the build instructions you got 2007 build instructions main build extruder build so the extruder build should have that all pretty clear in there um so that's how the extruder looks. Uh, all coiled up, but yeah, that's, that's the heat sink there. Um, so that's the heater block. That's the heater block. That's the heat sink right there, page uh, section five, build three, that's in the manual. You see that, right? Great. Yeah, it's Great. yeah. There. It's good. The, the main build manual, so that I, sh I, I need to take a look at that. Yep, and then uh, just on a build, like the critical thing there is like these this heat paste there because uh, that heat paste allows you to cool. Uh, the, okay, so the main way that an extruder works is that you have the solid wire that gets pressed in and then it melts. But the thing is, in the melt zone like you can't push that like once it melts it's out of control so you want to have a clear break between the solid part and the molten part and the idea that this is inside this this heat sink you're basically cooling this near 300 C uh, of the heater and by the time it's here it's like 35 C so this because the fan is there you're cooling that rapidly inside that heat this is called the heat break so the way you get all that heat out is you got to make sure you have heat paste there to get that heat out of that that heat break that tube into the big heat uh big heat sink block so that you can get that sharp thermal gradient between your hot end and the part where the filament goes in because you gotta it's got to be solid in order for you to control the push because you're pushing it you're pushing it very uh the, the extruder has a tight control of how, how much you're pushing so that you control how much you're extruding. So therefore you need a nice clear break between the solid part and the molten part. Just saying and explaining how the extruder works is that you, you need that to be a nice gradient, uh, a very sharp mm -hmm. gradient. So don't forget that heat paste there. That'll be like the right. secret to a really high performance extruder. And that's our own design. So it's fully open source. I mean, this is, uh, I th so we did that uh, to replace the Titan Arrow because we were tired of the Titan Arrow just clogging up and every time it clogs up you gotta open it and all these little tiny parts fly out and that's you can't do that for production printing uh, so ours is completely accessible like you can see where the filament goes in if you have any clog you, you like release that in, in five seconds so it's just much much more streamlined for performance if and really like clog free because the distance between the point you're driving the filament and where it melts um, 
the the heat break part that distance is the smallest in the industry no one does it as small as we do which means we have the highest performance for um, flexible filaments the flexible filaments are already they already bend so you can only go uh, have so much performance on how fast you can uh, push them through without them curling up like a like a noodle so our performance mm -hmm. we claim is the best um, best in the industry on that aspect for three millimeter extruders like the Titan arrow it's like you look look, look at our documentation but we show like we've got like 28 millimeters and then the Titan arrow has got like almost twice as much uh, as far as the distance so there's only so so much you can do for rubber we're, we're paying attention to rubber because we want to do things like print rubber tracks for tractors so <laughs> it's important to wow. us yeah. yeah, I'm actually interested in 3D, trying to 3D print some um, rubber band, well, you know, flexible TPU or whatever it is, bands yeah. to fix, to fix uh, cassette record, like like audio cassette, old audio cassette recorders, belt driven audio cassette recorders. I want to try printing these little thin belts to see if I can get it to work. Yeah, yeah, uh, you could definitely, definitely do that. You can use the 0.4 nozzles for doing that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. The print, like, if you look at your printer, I mean, we print with the big nozzles. There, we typically print 1.2 nozzles because they're super fast and the prints are super strong. Now they don't look clean. You got to clean them off a little bit. But then you can go. The, the, we sent you the 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and 1.2. The 1.2 is already attached. Uh, but mm -hmm. with the 0.4, you can get the very nice details. Um, but just to show you, like for rubber, we're more interested in stuff like uh, this. These heavy-duty belts for like a shredder application where mm -hmm. um, we're taking, so it, it, this is actually quite interesting. This is 100% 3D printed, but here you've got a tiny 100 watt motor, uh, just a tiny motor like that, like in a cordless drill uh, with a lot of gear down. In fact, like 3000 fold gear down that we're doing uh, huh. with belts like this that get you enough torque for like a shredder application. So that is, that's cool stuff because you can get use this tiny motor that it's slow but it still works it has huge torque after you gear it down uh you can look at that shredder design that's on our wiki too but you can print that kind of stuff um well maybe not with your tiny printer which has got a six inch bed but we printed that on an 18 inch bed for the the big uh, big belts stuff like that great thank you so much yeah yeah so if you guys have any questions in a build uh, I'll put I'll add a couple of pages just summarizing all the electronics parts, but maybe if, if you guys have questions or um, we can meet another time to get the first run procedure. Uh, but it's actually pretty cool because all you got to do is um, because you have the automatic bed leveling through the probe, the startup procedure is essentially you let it probe the bed and then you adjust like on the first run you adjust because it won't know how high the you can do the bed leveling, but it won't really know how high off the bed you are it knows a general range to within like a millimeter or two um, so then you do this fine tune and you save that value and that's it and you and you're set for printing so on a first print you can make that adjustment it'll print correctly and you're done so even on a very first print you should succeed if you're if you got all your mechanical system going so it's, it's relatively easy but it's a lot of detail to get to that point um, if you do it it'll fire right up yeah yep Maybe. yeah so well so let's uh you know let's set a time in two weeks from now to uh, do the actual uh free cad session where we can teach you how to design anything and uh, for that actually uh we're going to free cad 16 because we don't want to put any confusion like the free cad 18 it's got some extra features that confuse the workflow i want you all to be able to do that exercise after under one hour of teaching that you can draw a feature upon a feature any geometrical shape and with that kind of process you can generate just about any geometry all the design that we do like including those belts uh, 3d printer parts whatever we do is done using that very simple workflow so that workflow is very powerful and it can be taught in like an hour using open source tool chain so um, install uh, i would actually suggest um, download the FreeCAD 16 app image if you guys have heard of app images 
I can follow up with that. Or just use the OSC Linux 2.0, which is uh, included in your... Uh, uh, Ray, ha have you been testing the Cura and the FreeCAD? On it, it's all good, right? We're all good on a FreeCAD 16 on OSC 2 Linux that you guys should yes. do with a printer. Mm -hmm. It's it's all it's all there. So just use FreeCAD 16. And if you don't yeah. have FreeCAD uh, 16, uh, just uh, download an app image. App images are uh, specifically for Linux. Uh, so do they work on, on Mac and Windows as well, or no? That's different. No, it's it's a Linux. Okay, it's okay. Linux specific. Okay. I thought they also had that for the other systems, but all right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, who got their uh, their Arduino actually? Uh, the minimalist Arduino actually working. I I didn't I didn't follow along because Duke, you got it. Uh, if you you got it, Dante. Ray, you did too. I didn't get my parts in time. <laughs> uh, so we got two people. That's cool. Hey, so maybe that. that's great. That's great. Uh, so take a picture of that. Uh, se send it to us. Send it to me. Um, get a nice picture so we we see everything. If there were any tricks you had to do to make it work, but that's pretty good. I mean, uh, little microcontroller that you can now program in any way. And you programmed it uh, by putting into another Arduino. Yeah, I first plugged it into the regular Uno board and then pried it off. Nice. Dante, awesome. is, did you do the same? Oh, I can't hear you. You you're, look like you're muted. You there you go. You did this, the same process? You pried it into the working Arduino? Yeah, he, he's using the Uno right now. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, but that's that's good. That's good stuff. So, yeah, well, that's a, that's a good day. So I think, I don't know, any other questions or anything we can go through right now or call it for two weeks from now? Uh, the, the good thing is, like, mm -hmm. we do have the decent design. Like, with the small 3D printer, you can print all the parts for the electric motor that we linked. Um, so if you're ambitious and you want to just get yourself the magnets and do all of that, that's a proven design it works so try it if you're ambitious i actually haven't done it myself i just didn't have the time but if you want to do that and and um, share that that would be awesome because i think it's completely practical to do a that motor because it uses an electronic controller it's actually very efficient it's more efficient than most motors that are out there so that's actually a really good example of where you're showing here's a uh, 3D printing, high-performance neodymium magnets, plus an electronic controller off the shelf, and efficiency is really high because it doesn't have the commutator and brushes. It's an electronically controlled motor, so it's pretty, pretty decent. I would really encourage you guys to check that out if you can. Yeah. Uh, link to the motor. That's um, Dirks. So Dirk Log has, um, let me just, Dirk's, let me just do that there, but that's, uh, you can take a look at the, I just type, pasted in the link to the electric motor. I sent that in one of the emails that I sent to you all, uh, so you can also pick it up there. But that's Dirk from the Netherlands, he did that, it's full CAD and free CAD, just using um, these disc magnets and 8 millimeter millimeter bearings like skate bearings and the same shaft like the same eight millimeter shaft that we use in the printer that's the axis and the rest is 3d printed parts uh, it's pretty nice so if you uh, do build that you can do that I mean yeah guys I mean show it show it that you can do it with this printer that you built yourself that would be really cool cool yeah All right, so I'd say, uh, yeah, let's call for that. Uh, I can send you on the to the, we do have a couple of the nice videos on a, on a KiCad instructional that Peter Hijma from the Netherlands did, uh, showing through, a, going through a basic diagram like Mitch showed today, but he's doing that in, in KiCad for a basic lesson of how to set that up and actually get a file that if you want to send that to like a board shop, you can actually send that and make your little board for your little Arduino and stuff like that. You can share that. Okay. Other than that, I think let's quit right here. That was a long day. Great work. Mm -hmm.
and um, keep on hacking. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Okay, guys. Thanks, thanks a lot. And we'll see you guys in two weeks. So I'll follow up in an email. Take care. Okay, cool. Thanks. Bye. Bye, y'all.